Hello, my name's Joel Dunning. I'm here at the Royal College of Surgeons of England today, the 2nd of February 2023. And we're here for the biggest ever Pectus event held here in the United Kingdom. We've brought together patients, clinicians, journalists, members of parliament and decision makers to try and decide a way forward for Pectus treatment. We're going to present our guidelines and this is a completely unedited, full version of the video of everything that went on. It is true to say that it is a time of great turmoil for treatment of Pectus in England. If you're coming to this video to find out more about Pectus generally, things might have changed over the years and the months. So feel free to please get in contact with me, Joel Dunning at nhs.net uh, or join the Facebook group Pectus Excavatum Support UK. This video is here to show you really everything we decided and the things that we talked about. But best of all, uh, we heard from our patients uh, and, and their plight. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, I'll first of all hand over to Simon Clark MP. He's been a complete stalwart and unfailing supporter of Pectus issues for many, many years. So he will introduce the event and then we'll go to the event itself. Thank you very much for watching. Hello, my name's Simon Clark and I'm the Member of Parliament for Middlesbrough South and East Cleveland. And I'd like to start by saying a huge thank you to everybody attending today's event for your interest in and support for the better treatment of pectus. Pectus is, as we know, a cruel condition which affects a small but important number of young people across our country. And making sure that we deliver the best quality of care for people affected by it is something which has become a personal priority for me. The work of the SCTS has been absolutely critical in helping to deliver uh, the new guidelines that we're welcoming today, but also critically the heightened awareness which is going to be so important if we are to change outcomes and improve uh, sufferers' lives. For my part, uh, I, I was brought to awareness of this condition by Autumn Bradley, a very brave and remarkable uh, young lady from my constituency living in the market town of Gisborne. And Awesome's fight for proper treatment uh, was brought to my attention by Joel Dunning, the remarkable professor from James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough. Joel was clear from the outset that Awesome, a sufferer of pectus whose condition was deteriorating sharply, could only be alleviated through proper thoracic surgery. And he was fighting a desperate battle to make sure that Autumn could receive the care that she needed. The lack of understanding of pectus and the mystifying decision by the NHS authorities in England to not offer the treatment that is available in other parts of the UK meant that this had become a really intractable case and I've been pleased to highlight it in Parliament and to put pressure on health ministers to respond. Awesome has been the recipient of private treatment which has allowed her to make a full recovery and the difference uh, in, 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 in this young woman's life has been quite remarkable from someone who was losing her respiratory capacity, missing a huge amount of school, and was unable to take part in, the, in absolutely fundamental parts of life, from exercise to simply going out with friends, Autumn is now transformed into a happy, healthy young person. The worry that I have is that not everybody can access the private treatment that Autumn was fortunate enough to be offered by a benefactor. And of course, how many more cases are going at the moment forward with unmet need. That's why I am so passionate about making sure that we do change the guidance on pectus, that we do secure access to the treatment that can change young people's lives, and that the best practice guidelines that the SCTS are now taking forward are part of a wider shift towards the proper treatment of this condition. I pledge today to do everything in my power to help this campaign, and certainly I, I know that there are many colleagues in Parliament who feel likewise. We need to keep banging the, banging the drum until change comes. But your voice, your work and your expertise will be critical if we're to do so. So thank you. And I look forward to meeting many of you over the months and years ahead as we continue this, this vital campaign. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, first, uh, thank you for joining us all today. Um, my name is Noreen Mordani. I'm president of the Society for Cardiopathic Surgery in Great Britain and Ireland. And it's a real honour to be able to host this event and to welcome you all here today. 
Um, this is a really important day for us as a society, but I can imagine it's a really important for all of you here. Um, we want to welcome all the patients and relatives of um, uh, individuals with pectus deformities of the chest. The specialists that have come here today, surgeons, pediatricians, physiotherapists, psychologists, all of us supporting the cause to make sure patients with pectus deformities of the chest can get uh, access to treatment. On top of that, I'd like to thank the Royal College of Surgeons who are hosting us here today and their great support for the cause of what we're trying to achieve. And we'll hear a few words from the Vice President later this afternoon. In addition, I'd like to thank all the other Royal Colleges, Royal College in Edinburgh and Glasgow for their support, and all the other specialist associations, some of which have got representatives here today. Um, in addition, we've got members of Parliament supporting the cause to try and achieve access for all of you to get to treatment. We've also got members of the journalists and members of the media, and also a whole host of other people who are here to help you as patients or as individuals with the condition to get access to treatment. So. Um, I'll go through the programme in a minute, but I just thought um, before we start, um, um, I'd try and outline some of the reasons why we're all here today. Um, for a lot of you, you know that currently there is a lack of access for treatment for patients with pectus conditions of the chest in England. Um, this is a big difference to what occurs in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And this, this inequity is something that we feel really strongly about and we want to support you in the journey to try and get access for treatment. We understand the significant psychological and physiological impact that pectus conditions on the chest can have and we want to do all that we can to help you. Um, trying to do this, we've gone through processes through NHS Specialist Commissioning, but we find one of the best ways is to try and provide um, a holistic national approach to what is the best practice for patients with these conditions so that we can set the gold standard that will allow patients in all parts of our country to get access to treatment. Um, we are very lucky to have some of the authors of uh, these uh, guidelines that we put together here today and they'll talk to you about what, what it means and how we can move forward with this condition. I'll leave this slide up intermittently so that you'll understand what we are trying to achieve here today. But most importantly, today is about hearing from you as patients and as family members about the journey you are, have been through and are going through so that we can all get a better understanding of what it's like to live with pectus conditions. So I just thought I'd give you a brief overview of the programme today. We're first going to try and get an understanding of what pectus is um, and how it affects patients. And we, you can hear that from specialists and clinicians, but more importantly, after that we will hear from some patients who've got some really heartbreaking and powerful stories to get an understanding of the impact it has on their lives. Following that, we will talk about the history and the different treatments available to patients. Um, we will then hear about some of the evidence behind these treatments and how it supports the case and why it is used in other countries. We will then hear from some patients who've gone through the treatments and surgery for pectus conditions. And then we'll hear um, following that from different parts of the country, different parts of the Great Britain and the United Kingdom, why it is offered in Scotland and, and Wales and the services that they offer there. And then finally, we will hopefully hear from a member of the NHS Specialist Commissioning to explain why it is not offered in England and different changes that we can move forward with. Um, and then finally, Joel, who's put a lot of work into developing the best practice guidance, will explain to, to us what he's put in the document and how hopefully it can change practice moving forward. And then finally, there'll be a few comments from the Vice President of the Royal College here and, and Lynn, who will also talk about um, the great um, publication that she's put together and how we can all um, move forward with this. Um, I'd like to also introduce them to you, Lynn Evans, who's one of our co-chairs here today. She's a mother of two children with a condition and we'll tell you a little bit more about what it means to her and why this is important. Good afternoon, everyone. It's too close. No, I, I really feel very privileged to be here today. Um, in a bit of state of shock as well because um, 
really it's only been in the last 18 months that I've even known about these conditions. Uh, so my eldest has been diagnosed with PE, my youngest with PC. Um, and just like many of you here, I couldn't believe the lack of information, lack of knowledge, um, the utter confusion around trying to get treatment pathways to the boards. We'll come on to it a lot later. But um, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who contributed as well your stories to the book because I really hope this is going to change the way that we can get treatment through the NHS going forward uh, in England. <coughs> I'd just like to introduce my other co-chair, Anna Kunal's colleague from Cambridge, and is also the uh, co-chair of the Thoracic Committee of the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for coming along today. Um, this is a really important event. Um, as a professional society, uh, we have for many years been involved in advocacy, and it is very important that patients and professionals guide the delivery of services and the pathway. Um, so I'm going to pass back to the range to carry on the meeting. Thank you. So, so we'll move through the programme. The first, it's a real honour to introduce Ian Hunt, who is a fellow cardiothoracic surgeon. He works at St George's Hospital and for many years has been providing surgery for patients with pectoral conditions of the chest and is a great advocate for what we should be doing and moving forward. So he's going to be telling us about what is the condition and the reasons for the deformity. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I get to talk at a lot of meetings and conferences around the place, and I have to say this is probably the most emotive I've ever talked at. I'm a bit nervous, really honoured. I, I think you guys have created amazing about what you're trying to achieve here. And a little bit embarrassed that we've not been able to support you in some ways through the NHS program, despite our best efforts, like Joel, particularly, and we're hoping through these sorts of meetings, these sort of advocacy groups, that we can change things around. And we're really hoping this is going to make a change for everybody in this room today. I get easy bit. I talk about pectus, I show some pictures. You guys are very knowledgeable about this stuff, so um, I'll whiz through my understanding of what pectus is. Uh, it's a common condition. I think it's more common than we realise. Quoted as 1 in 400 to 1 in 1500 children, pectus excavatum is meant to be more common than pectus caramatum. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think they're both equally common. Uh, there is a family history, um, though it's quite sporadic. Um, often you have a great aunt or uncle who may have pectus you may not be aware of. I've certainly had that experience in my clinic quite a few times. Uh, it's quoted around 25% of patients with a family history of pectus deformities. Um, males are more affected, and again, the literature would say uh, four to five times more affected, and certainly my experience. Whether it's congenital or developmental, uh, interesting, in my experience, around 10% of patients will report having a deformity from birth or shortly after birth, but often patients are presenting in their early teen period, typically with this associated growth spurt, which we'll touch on again in a minute, but uh, that seems to be the most common presentation for most patients I'm seeing. Um, in terms of types of deformity, pectus excavatum, the, the, this form of type of pectus that you're familiar with, pectus caronatum, uh, or pigeon chest, uh, mixed pectus, less common, but um, often described as more of a complex problem, so often you'll find pigeon chest on one side of the chest, pectus excavatum on the other side of the chest, uh, pectus arcinutum, which is a, a, a rare and more complicated pectus where you often get an associated short and stern and some other elements to, to create a more complicated deformity. Um, and they're the sorts of typical things we see, and then everything in between. So you can often find fairly complicated chest problems, but within that kind of broad group of patients that we see. Um, it's associated with an abnormal cartilage growth. Um, why this happens is unclear, but fundamentally what appears to happen is most of the front of the chest is made of cartilage. Um, that cartilage seems to elongate uh, during a growth period. And as it elongates, my description for it would be that it kind of creates a buckling effect. And that buckling effect can cause just the sternum, the breastbone, to be pushed inwards, or pectus excavatum, or outwards, pectus caronatum. And that growth of that cartilage can be symmetrical, it can be 
asymmetric or lopsided. It can affect the lower rib cage, as, as you can see on, on this image, the, the lower rib cage, what we call the costal arch, is also affected. So there's lots of elements to this, but the fundamental um, pathology, um, the cause of vector seems to be related to this, this abnormal growth, uh, which happens typically during that growth spurt. Um, one of the things I was chatting to a colleague about this morning was the rate of growth spurt seems to be quite uh, an element to, to the story I hear. Many young patients seem to have a very rapid growth spurt, so the kind of classic story I would hear would be we were on, on holiday in the summer, he took his shirt off, didn't see anything, and then three months later, getting buying his school shirt for, for, for the winter term, and you look at his chest and he's got this deformity developing. It can be that rapid, it can be quite astoundingly rapid. And I certainly recognize that, that story in many patients I'm seeing. Body shape, another element, um, we describe it as being ectomorphic, that's the type of shape. Tall, slim, young boys, occasionally young girls. Um, there is an element of body shape to this condition which isn't particularly well advertised amongst in the literature, but certainly well recognized amongst surgeons who see lots of patients with this condition. There's lots of other changes associated with pectus. Um, many of these changes can cause quite a lot of concerns. Rib flare, where you have uh, a rib that sticks out. Uh, scoliosis, an associated condition which can also be prevalent in patients with pectus. Uh, posture changes, one of my pet topics. Uh, posture changes are quite common within patients with pectus. Not just the slouchy teenage posture, but a little bit more profound than that. And so we often see changes of that type in patients with this condition. Um, there's also elements. Sorry, I'll quickly show some pictures. So there's also this is this is a typical example of rib flare, which you might see in a young person with a pectus excavatum in this situation. Uh, the scoliosis, as I touched on, and often I think of scoliosis and pectus being something that lives together. And, it, it, you often find one tends to dominate another, um, but they often do appear to, uh, as, as, a, as a, in the same person. And the posture changes I was talking to, the rolling of the shoulders, the rather kyphotic or curved spine that we see, these are the sort of elements that we typically see in, in young patients presenting with this condition. Syndromes. So there's many uh, concerns in patients and parents I see about is this an unlike syndrome causing this condition? And there are associated syndromes, connective tissue disorders, disorders affecting the soft tissues, the, the muscles, bones, and cartilage of the body, which can be associated with pectus. And the most common one we have heard about, and um, Dr. Charles here representing the Marfan organization, is Marfan syndrome. But there are other forms. There are also other uh, musculoskeletal disorders, um, such as Poland syndrome or osteogenesis imperfecta, which can also present with a pectus deformity. And these are other syndrome things we occasionally see. That's me. <laughs> Do any members of the audience have any questions for in particular, just if it's affecting you or your family, or any just questions related to that before we move on to some of the other talks? You don't, sorry, you don't know quite yet where it starts from. The, the Poland syndrome and the uh, Pectus syndrome, my daughter has two, but I I blamed myself for maybe doing something while I was pregnant to stop the syndrome. No, I mean, Dr. Charles, our expert geneticist, will explain it's not that problem. You haven't done anything wrong. It's nothing you've given your child. It's just some children have abnormalities because of the genetics that they're, they're, they're offered, and, and that's the nature of these things. Nothing you've done. kids as they hit puberty, is there a typical stopping point where you can think, oh, it's this bad now, but at least it's not going to get any worse? That's a really good question, a question I often get asked. Um, often if you look at your own family growth spurts, if you have children that tend to, thank you, if you have children in your family that tend to grow later in life, that means it may persist. If most of your family members, other family members tend to grow at a certain Rates, so they grow, most of their growth spurts happens between the ages of 11 and 13. That's likely towards the end of that age group that where, where their pectus will quite, quite stop. Now, one of the things we 
and one of our big messages is it doesn't disappear with age, as you may have, some of you may have heard other colleagues say to you, which is incorrect. But what will happen is it will continue to grow proportionate to, to with the child as it becomes a teenager. So the simple answer is it's quite variable, but most patients, in my experience, if you look at the average 13 year old, most of the time, most times that actors is what it will be, it won't continue to develop in terms of becoming disproportionate to that child as it continues to grow. But it is quite variable. Just, um, can I encourage all of you to ask as many questions as you want? It's a great opportunity to have experts in the room, so please feel free to take and ask questions. Just one here. Can I ask you, have you identified the gene? How close are you to screening and identifying that it's in the womb? Because like lots of things like congenital defects, if you can get them when they're really small, then this is, uh, it doesn't help those who've got it now, but it'll certainly help the next generation. Yeah, cool. yeah. Thank you. A great question. I'm very con conscious of Dr. Charles staring at me. He's my geneticist <laughs> colleague, uh, ex colleague from St. George's. We work together there. She should answer that question. But fundamentally, my understanding is not that type of gene genetic disorder. It, it doesn't have that kind of lineage. I touched on it before. Many of you may have experienced this that lots of patients, they may not appear to have any other relatives who have the condition. But then I've certainly experienced this in my clinic occasionally where somebody pipes up, usually your grandma who's come along to the clinic, will say, Oh, Uncle George, he had it. You know, and so it's that kind of inheritance with Pectus specifically. You're also touching on connective tissues, so other specific syndromes, and Pectus forms a type of deformity amongst other things for that syndrome. So it's so it's just a sort of the message is most patients will have a pectus deformity not related to a syndrome specifically, but there may be a genetic lineage or inheritance within the condition within that family, but it's not tied to a specific gene in that group. Thank you. And um, I was just wondering, does the depth of the pectus actually change as the child grows? So if you do a scan at 10, and they're three centimetres, will that stay the same as they grow, the depth, or will it change? I'm very conscious not to step on my toes, colleagues' toes, and some of these questions may be directed them in a few, few more lectures. Really good question. Back to the growth. So if they're 10 years old and they're still growing, it's, quite, it's possible the pectus will become deeper disproportionately as they grow at 10 years old. If they were 13 when they were measured, it may not grow deeper, but it may grow proportionally with them. So there's a subtle difference, but hopefully that's appreciated, that it will continue to worsen in younger children, it may not continue to worsen in older children, if that makes sense, but, but proportionally it continues. So how index might change? It might change in a 10-year-old, yes. but it may not change in a 40 or 15-year-old, because most of their growth is completed, if that makes sense. I just want to make one observation from having read all the stories in the book. Um, we have three ladies who are sort of in their um, middle ages, if you like, and all of them have commented that they felt their symptoms have progressed as they got older, um, particularly going through menopause. So I don't know if there's any, what the science is behind that, but I thought I'd just mention it. That's a great question. I haven't touched the symptoms. I mean, I specifically talked about uh, that's going to be another kind of topic for other colleagues to discuss. And it's a very good point. I think the symptoms are, are really important, but I specifically, my reading was to talk about Becker's, not about the symptoms associated with that. Is there anything showing up indicating a connection between prematurity or maybe? Um, early term babies who are being born and, and living much better than maybe 20, 30 years ago because Ross, who has the condition for us, was born very premature and we wondered if there was a connection between that or the hormone um, drugs that they gave to, to prevent labour at that stage, if there's any connection. We don't seem to have family history and we don't know the answer to that. I'm going to do that really annoying thing surgeons do, Joel's laughing at me, where I say, it's outside my area of expertise. <laughs> Don't you just hate that when they say that to you? Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I've got some excellent pediatric surgeons in front of me. I'll pass the question on to them. Hey, do you want to answer that? <clears throat> um, uh, Sean Marlin from Sheffield Children's Hospital. Yeah, we were just agreeing that uh, premature babies do get chest wall deformity of all types. Um, 
and they may be a separate entity altogether. to the discussion a couple of questions ago. So I'm 39 with a home of about eight-ish. Um, only just managed to get through to Mr. Dunning. Um, if I do nothing, what happens? Because my symptoms have only really started to deteriorate in the last four years. So my growth spurt has obviously finished a while ago. So why is it that with the ageing process, the symptom and the profile seems to be worse, although I'm not growing anymore? These are great questions, by the way, guys. Really good questions. So firstly, the focus of this on young patients. Clearly, there's not a group of patients who are suffering from hectares, and we're not ignoring that at all. I mean, that's just the focus of today. But we keep reminding ourselves as a young and adult group of patients suffering from this condition. Your comment is really interesting, uh, a question they ask a lot. Um, there's a couple of elements to it. Um, with Bexadex Quartum, the Halloran is open, right? is it physiologically affecting you? For sure, for sure. I, I, I'm not going to go, we're going to talk about evidence later. We're going to talk about very complicated kind of tests, etc. etc. et cetera, but is it affecting you? For sure, right? How it's going to affect you as you get older? Well, age has an effect as well. Uh, one of the elements about pectus is it also, I touched on it briefly about posture elements. There are things that happen to your body which, will, which I think pectus make worse. Posture elements that change. So whether your pectus has got deeper or not, probably not, but your body around your pectus is kind of growing inwards in some ways. If you think about your posture, kind of you know, falling, collapsing down into your chest. And certain patients, to often say their symptoms feel worse than they were when they were younger. So I think it's a very interesting comment, really helpful comment. Other conditions develop, you can develop other problems as you get older. So when I see, my oldest is 73, patients with pectus deformity who are concerned about their fall failing health, there's no doubt pectus is an additive effect on failing health as you become older. My suggestion in older patients is to maintain good health, maintain good posture, all of the simple, easy things we say which are really hard to do. Um, but yes, I recognise your comment. In the interest of time, okay, can we get, we'll find a slot for your, in the interest of time, we can move on to the next session. Um, thank you, Ian, for that fantastic presentation. Thank you. reasons we're here today is um, to have some of the experts to tell you about the condition but for me as a doctor one of the most powerful things reading Lynn's book and the stories we put together put, put in the book is about hearing from all of you and what the significant impact it has on your life and so a uh, great pleasure to allow Lynn to introduce some of the next speakers that will give us an understanding of the impact that it has on Hello everyone. Um, I normally like to freestyle presentations, but um, I am going to be touching on some of the stories in the book today because there are many patients who contributed their stories who can't be here. So I have got a few notes, so do excuse me if I'm uh, looking down every now and again. Um, but I'm going to just kick off with really, I guess, my story, why I'm here, how we came about writing the book, and then um, we're going to have a couple of patients talk uh, about the challenges that, that they faced uh, and you'll start to understand some real consistency around what we're saying. So, up until 24 months ago, I had never heard of pectus excavatum or pectus carinatum. I had absolutely no idea that chest could grow inwards. I had no idea chest could grow outwards. Um, the only thing I'd come to learn about was through talking with my dad he mentioned that my grandfather was pigeon chested and he hadn't been a very well man, but that was it really. Um, nothing else was talked about, and certainly my father didn't have a condition, my sister and I were both fine. So, this was up until 18 months ago when my eldest son pointed out to me one morning that his chest was sinking in. And as a parent, this was shocking, um, incomprehensible. 
I possibly had seen the gradual development of it um, in the months leading up to his announcement because the lad clicked down to him being really skinny, a skinny teenager who's shooting up and he needs to just, you know, stand up quite a bit better. But like any parent, um, I immediately wanted to understand what, what is this, what's causing this, what can I do to fix it? I needed some reassurance. We've seldom ever been let down by a health service before and I was quite shocked to discover the lack of knowledge that my GP had about the condition. We had a telephone appointment. He gave me factually incorrect information. Uh, we were told he might get better. I'd talked about the fact my son swam at the local tri club and his comment was, oh, well, it's, it's quite a common condition for swimmers, which led me to googling swimmers' chests to see if there was any fact in that. Uh, there wasn't. And I was offered no treatment pathway. Um, he said, don't worry, it's synthetic and it'll probably get better in time. But go away, get on with life. If you've got any concerns, come back. In the six months that followed, my son's condition uh, deteriorated to the point that his friends noticed in school. And then I discovered my son had been Googling and came to one day having self-diagnosed himself with Pogan syndrome. Um, and this led to fear, anxiety, and quite honestly, a 15 year old child should not be subjected to this. I would beg you to put yourselves in the shoes of a 15 year old boy who's discovering his chest is sinking in, and put yourselves in, in my shoes and many shoes around in this room today. The sense of fear, frustration, and helplessness trying to navigate through a system that has closed its doors on us. So feeling abandoned by the GP, I turned to Facebook. And there I found the most incredible community of people, 2,000 in fact, parents and patients who, like me, were finding themselves, finding themselves this quagmire of misinformation, dead-end corridors, contradictions, nearly all of you had been told that NHS England had sh shut its doors to them. Yet, Meanwhile, patients in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland were still having access to NHS funded treatment. Um, and then hearing of people turning up to, in England to meet surgeons being told, well, I can do something about your child, but I'm legally not allowed to. Instead, we are being told we have to fund surgery ourselves, achieve £23,000 at a time. You've got to ask yourselves, is this fair? Is this really fair? Through the group, I discovered that one cardiographic surgeon, Mr. Joel Dunning, was doing his best to support patients with non-surgical bracing techniques through the NHS. He's um, based at St. James uh, Cook, uh, sorry, James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough. And although we lived in Buckinghamshire, my mum's away, I knew we needed to get a referral. Phone to switch a new GP who um, basically said, no, 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 you don't need to go to him. I'm going to refer you to our local paediatric unit. And I thought maybe I should trust the process. We had a letter about three weeks later that said, if you haven't heard from us in four months, then ring this number. And thank goodness I took matters into my own hands. I waited for my son returned from school, took first to the chest, and fired the email off to Joel. Within an hour, I had a diagnosis. It is as easy as that. I phoned the GP back. And I was still being told, no, um, we won't see you. Um, you're going to have to wait for the paediatric referral to take place. And it came down to I threatened a formal complaint about, uh, against the practice. And that finally got me a face-to-face -face appointment. Uh, and from there, we were able to go and see uh, Joel. And by that point, we'd also discovered that my youngest son's chest had started going outwards. So again, I got a diagnosis then that he had peptis carinatum. To the lay person such as me, the healthcare system um, and crisis is ludicrous. It goes against everything we know about healthcare systems being there to support and improve the health of the patient. And through joining the community on Facebook, you know, I discovered we weren't alone in our pilgrimage. Mm. To Middlesbrough to go and find someone who could help. Others are travelling from Cornwall, from Devon, from what well, Joel, you know. Have you hit Australia yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
in the absence of any alternatives, you know, other being, others be less fortunate, and they have been putting their hands in their pockets and going private, just desperate for a pathway, uh, a plan, something to help their children. And many of us have been using crowdfunding, um, literally going out, making hates, running marathons, raising the money to get their children uh, the medical intervention they require. So when a post appeared in mid November on Facebook that this meeting was going to be happening today, there was a pre-meeting um, led by Selman Kendall, who many of you know in the room. And um, I came off that call, I just heard all these stories and parents and thought, gosh, there would be some discussion late for this event, we could have a few A4 pieces of paper of patient stories, that would be good. Um, I mean, I'm in a crazy boat of setting up a life writing business, and I thought, well, wouldn't we to have a book? We could, you know, gather a few stories, I mean, we might be able to get ten, that would be a good target. Uh, and the response has been phenomenal. We've ended up with 41 stories um, in the book that many of you have today. It makes for powerful, hard hitting reading. We have children, young know, adults, midlifers. The majority of them have PE, some with PC, they've opened up their hearts and experiences of what they've been living with on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't have the time today to review all the stories, um, but I am going to share one or two from people who can't be here today. And as I say, we're going to have a couple of speakers coming up shortly. The most staggering thing, as the person who sort of curated the stories together and popped them in the book, is the absolute consistency in what has been said. Nearly everyone is being told that treatment is no longer available on NHS England because it is a cosmetic condition. And let me tell you, you go and read the stories, go and read the book, in the order of impact, PEP is affecting people in the following ways. Number one, severe physiological conditions. Two, devastating, in some cases, mental health conditions, and three, the vast majority of practice patients in this room will tell you that the cosmetic aspect is a lesser concern. The reality is that many patients with practice are being severely impacted by the deformities in their bodies. They talk in volumes of feelings that their chests are being crushed, that air is being squeezed out of their lungs, and I'm quoting from stories that have been shared they are consistently suffering from heart palpitations, chest pains, restlessness, breathlessness, sleep apnea, syncope, um, which is fainting, fatigue and racing hearts. And these people are being unnecessarily referred to cardiac consultants who are now investigating for heart conditions. They're being sent to respiratory consultants to identify why are they struggling to breathe. Well, you just imagine if you had two centimetres of space between your sternum and your spine, it's not difficult to appreciate that lungs and hearts don't work when they don't have the normal cavity to operate within. An acquaintance of mine is a GP in England. Uh, I told them what I was doing, I was talking about the book, I told them about my son's diagnosis, and I I asked them about their thoughts on pectus and you know, what do they see and understand from the other side. And uh, they came back and said actually they think it's quite underdiagnosed and they didn't feel particularly knowledgeable about picking it up either. Um, and they also went on to share me a screenshot of the pathway, the remedy pathway that's available to them on their system. Whilst this pathway acknowledges that the condition can be mild or severe, it immediately makes reference to the fact that psychologically, PEP just has little psychological impact on a patient. Under referral guidance, the first thing it talks about is uh, for cosmetic reasons, surgery is uh, not available except in exceptional circumstances. So cosmetic is right at the top of the list. And only at the very bottom, does it recognise that further support may be required for physiological side effects and at that point recommends onward referral to cardiologists and respiratory consultants. And I know many of you are going, why have I been sent to heart specialists? Why have I been sent to a, 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 a lung specialist? I need to see a bracket, you know, cardiothoracic surgeon. Cardiothoracic surgeons are not mentioned anywhere. 
and neither are the relatively cheap non-surgical interventions that we have so many at a much earlier point in uh, the progression of their condition. So support for our patients is falling at the very first hurdle, which is the GP surgery. And you can hear that time and time again on Facebook. So we will shortly hear from Sandra and Lizzie, um, who are parents of Pepsi patients, and they're going to share uh, how, how the conditions have affected their families. But firstly, I'm just going to share a few sound bites from patients um, who are in the book, they can't be here today, um, just to give you an idea of the psychological and physiological impacts. So the first one is uh, from a lovely guy called Charlie. Charlie's 31 years old and has Pectus excavator. As I have got older, I am less phased by the appearance. Although I often daydream how it would feel to look down and see a hole in a normal chest. I imagine how it would feel to take a proper breath. My greatest struggle is breathing, having extreme heart palpitations after walking a small distance, despite being a slim and otherwise healthy 31-year-old. I suffer a lot with fatigue and feelings of breathlessness and lightheadedness, as well as disorientation, which impacts my day-to-day -day life. I've seen many professionals over the years and have had multiple surgeries, being made to believe my issues are either mental health related, such as anxiety, panic attacks, as well as being made out to be a hypochondriac. That's come up a lot in the book as well. I have received many operations for chronic nasal congestion, but this has not had a beneficial impact on my breathing or sleep apnea. I strongly believe the true cause of my poor health has literally been sat under my nose my whole life my pectus excavator. All the while, I have forever met GPs who have claimed that my pectus is not an issue, it's just cosmetic, it isn't a cause, there is no treatment available, learn to live with it. This has gone on my whole life. I remember as a 13-year-old telling one GP, I really struggle to take full breaths, sometimes it feels like I can't breathe. And the response, don't be silly, if you couldn't breathe, you wouldn't be talking to me just now. And just like that, they shut me down. Then there is 15 year old Marcus, uh, who has failed to secure treatment for his condition. Uh, his dad wrote in the book, um, Marcus has pepticeps relatum, and his dad clocked the alarming dip in Marcus's chest two years ago. We naturally visited our GP and started a referral route, thinking the NHS would help. Why wouldn't it? And this is where the nightmare started. As the months went by, Marcus's quality of life started to deteriorate. He started experiencing severe chest pains, couldn't eat properly, suffered fatigue and shortness of breath, and simply couldn't keep up with his peers. The dip in his chest worsened. We were hopeful something could be done when we finally got a referral to Birmingham Children's Hospital to see a thoracic consultant. The consultant was really sympathetic and apologised that yes, whilst he could fix Marcus, he was allowed to. Whilst we appreciated his honesty, it was nevertheless a shock to be told the NHS could not help our child. They were, however, happy to see us off with a number of private consultant uh, numbers uh, who might be willing to help us. Since then, we have watched our child live a half-life. He has days where the pain is so severe he cannot attend school. His attendance is now below 80%. And when he does try to attend, he often gets sent home because he cannot sit in a chair for hours due to the pain. We have attended only a few times when his chest pain has become frightening and intolerable. This staff role was lovely. They check his vitals and then they send him on his way because they are unable to treat him. It was even a challenge getting him a chest x-ray because Pectus is banned on NHS England. Imagine. Marcus is not able to walk very far without getting his pain, shortness of breath and fatigue. We went to Alton Towers a few months ago and we had to get a wheelchair for Marcus. Uh, because he couldn't manage to walk far. He is 15, an age when he should be free to run and have fun, not to have his parents parking around, pushing around a theme park in a wheelchair. 
And finally, a uh, much shorter excerpt here. This is uh, an excerpt from Mia's story, uh, told by her mum. Mia is a 10-year-old girl who has the most severe case of cactus, um, allegedly that apparently Joel Dunning has ever seen. Um, a Haller index is a measurement of the dip. An index of 3.5 is classified as severe. Mia's Haller uh, was measured as 20. She literally had a one centimetre gap between the sternum and the spine. Um, and her family are currently now exploring taking her to Scotland, even though they live in England, for the surgery that she don't so desperately needs because she can't have it anywhere near home. The last 18 months have been a struggle for my daughter. The syncope, which is fainting episodes, have become so frequently she has been terrified to leave the house in case she collapses. I have struggled to get her to go to school and her attendance has dropped drastically. Through the support of school staff, we have managed to get her back into school, but she still suffers with severe anxiety and only leaves the house to attend school. In November, we travelled to Glasgow to have an echocardiogram, a CPET, and to meet the chest wall surgeon, Dr. Carl Davis, who is with us today. After her echocardiogram, we were told her right ventricle is severely compressed because of the severity of her PE. My daughter's health is severely affected by her PE. I am now having to use a wheelchair to collect her from school, and she has fainting episodes just on the walk home. She no longer socialises with any of her friends and will not even participate in any family events that involve leaving the house. The PE is not only affecting her physical health, but also her mental health. She suffers with anxiety and depression, and she is unable to do anything that her friends do. She knows that she looks different to others. Nobody who, living in England, who is, you know, no one should need a wheelchair to get to school, and no one should have to travel over the border to seek treatment. Um, I'm now going to welcome to the stage uh, Sandra, who is going to share just a few words. Oh, I completely switched the screen off, sorry. <laughs> He's going to share a few words on how the condition has affected her son, Tony. Um, my son, Tony, was 13 years old when we were on a family holiday, and he's Someone's mentioned here is quite common. Um, his dad noticed he was on a treadmill, and his dad noticed that his heartbeat was showing as quite excessive. Um, his pectus was starting to worsen; it was getting a little bit deeper. And we already at this stage noticed that he had a pectus, but it was getting worse. Um, and when we arrived home, he was diagnosed in 2019. Um, his GP referred him to the local para, uh, paediatric at Southend Hospital. They did some tests, and they told us to go away. It was cosmetic. Don't worry about it. Um, we did, but I, at the time I wasn't quite sure about the diagnosis, so I did email Joel Dunning and he gave me some great guidance and recommendations for tests which were needed. However, we never went through these tests because then COVID hit. Um, two years later, TJ says to me um, that he, he was increasingly worse at this point. His sternum from the top of his chest to the bottom was so close to his spine, he was passing out, he was having chest pains, um, and it forced him to give up his beloved sport of Taekwondo. Um, TJ has been practicing Taekwondo since he was six years old. Um, he is a black belt, um, a regular competitor, and he has dreams of becoming a world champion. So to give up the sport so beloved like that was really heartbreaking. During Christmas of 2021, now age 15, he asked me if we could have a look at the NUS procedure. We had researched it, we had spoke about it, and it was his decision to go forward in that way. We returned to the GP, having done our homework, and we requested a referral to Dr. Calvacar at St. Barth in London, as he was more local to us. Dr. Calvacar saw Tony in March 2022, and he confirmed his pectus, and he recommended, um, oh sorry, he confirmed his pectus severe. He has a Hallier index of five, along with enlarged aorta and a displaced heart. It was recommended that we have the NUS procedure, and that we were to apply for the individual funding request. That's fun. <laughs> in September 2022, after months of tests undertaken both under the NHS and paid for privately, we were told that the new medical director at St. Bart was less sure that St. Bart's should be processing the appeals, given the high failure rate versus the time and investigations required to put the appeal together. 
Our IFR had been submitted in July, but it transpired that it never even reached the panel uh, because the director would not sign it off. And that was a huge blow to us because the paperwork was already done. How could you not sign it off? <laughs> um, Tony is now waiting to see if he'll qualify for a potential clinical trial being led by Joel Dunning. He is increasingly agitated about the delay in his treatment and how his life is being unnecessarily impacted. In the meantime, his teenage years are slipping away, and along with it, his dreams of Taekwondo Championship. As a family, we're currently trying to raise funds to treat him privately. He has also been to physiotherapy and has a report from the physiotherapist explaining that the pectus is damaging his back and his nerves in turn. He has Raynard syndrome, which he believes to be linked to his pectus. We believe that had Tony been prescribed the vacuum bell when he was 13 and first showed symptoms, that it would have stopped the progression of the pectus. We're disappointed that there are not clear guidelines for the medical practitioners to be guided by. Many clinicians do not even know that vacuum bell funding is available in the NHS, and it should be routinely used, as it is in Scotland, from the age of eight, apparently, as a preventative measure to those children showing early signs. We believe that there is a case for patients who have a medical need to be funded for pectus surgery. This is what the NHS is for. Failure to do so goes against the NHS Constitution for England. Um, I've printed off the NHS Constitution for England, and I just wanted to read a very short extract from it for you guys. Um, introduction to NHS Constitution. <laughs> the NHS belongs to the people. It's there to improve our health and well-being, to support us, uh, to keep mentally and physically well, and to get better when we are ill, and when we cannot fully recover. To stay as well, and when we cannot fully recover, to stay as well as we can until the end of our lives. It works at the limits of science, bringing the highest levels of human knowledge and skill to save lives and to improve health. It touches our lives at times of basic human need, when care and compassion are what matters most. On the principles of the NHS guidelines, there's just two points I wanted to also read to you guys. It says the patient will be at the heart of everything the NHS does. It also says in point seven, the NHS is accountable to the public, communities, and the patients that it serves. The NHS is a national service funded through national taxation, and it is the government which sets the framework of the NHS, and which is accountable to Parliament for its operation. And finally, on the list of NHS values, the very last value that really, really stood out to me was that everyone counts. It says we maximise our resources for the benefit of the whole community. And we make sure that nobody is excluded, discriminated against, or left behind. Nobody, except it would seem, those patients with pectus. Thank you, Sandra. I just have some really important really points there. Um, and actually, Timmy's not the only one who's giving up on it. There's a lot of kids who are missing out on progressing and pursuing special talents um, and dreams as a result of this condition. I'm just going to now quickly hand over to Lizzie, um, who's going to share some of the challenges that her family have faced, in particular some of the men mental health challenges as well. Um, I just first of all want to say how I feel like I'm among family and friends and everybody here. It's, it's so lovely to see everybody. It's just really fantastic um, and harking back to what was said at the beginning my son's um, just been diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type 3 as well so there's a bit of time with that too um, my son Eddie was diagnosed with pectus excavatum in 2019 age 13 and GP was fantastic and instantly referred him to Brighton Children's Hospital at the initial consultation we learned that NHS England funding had been removed for the operation Eddie needed. He would therefore have to undergo many appointments of evidence gathering, which would be shared with the medical board to prove his suitability for the operation. We were told that the only way he would get the operation would be if the pectus excavatum was causing him psychological distress from a body image standpoint. At this point, Eddie didn't care about his dip. He was using it as a bowl for tortilla chips but was already showing physical signs of breathlessness, lack of energy and dizziness. We had appointment after appointment and each one caused Eddie more anxiety and distress. 
He also has Asperger's syndrome and struggles with social interaction and new people, situations and places. Due to the anxiety of the multitude of appointments, Eddie develops severe OCD. He has taken control of his entire life. He was referred to CAMS, who did the best that they could, given that they are woefully understaffed and underfunded. We're slowly trying to move forward, but his pectus excavator makes things so hard that he cannot live a normal teenage life. He cannot walk very far because of the palpitations and breathlessness. He gets terrible headaches and is in constant pain. When COVID hit, we switched to phone appointments. I was told by a pulmonology consultant at Brighton Children's Hospital, who had never even met or examined Ed, that all Eddie's symptoms were psychological and that I was a hysterical mother. This man dared to write a letter to my GP saying he had explained to me that all Eddie's symptoms were in his head and caused by anxiety. My GP bought into this nonsense and advised Eddie to try to start doing more and to see a counsellor. Not helpful. At this point, I joined the Facebook Pectus Excavation Support Group. I heard about the wonderful job done um, got my GP to refer Eddie to him and the rest is history. Joel has been nothing but caring and supportive. He's proven all of Eddie's symptoms are coming from a physical cause and not a psychological one. <coughs> Two of the chambers of Eddie's heart are crushed and so he becomes tachycardic when he stands up or walks. That also causes the breathlessness and the faintness. He has approximately 60% fitness of a child his age. Eddie's Hallett index is 5.3. He also has POTS. Ed has absolutely no quality of life due to his pectus excavator. He cannot really leave the house. This and the pressure of all the appointments that he had to attend during the pointless evidence gathering phase have caused extreme mental and emotional distress. He cannot think about getting any kind of job until his chest is fixed because he has to sit in a fetal position to reduce his rib and spinal pain and to keep his head pointed forward because of the scoliosis in his neck caused by the pectus. Ed's condition affects all of us as well. To try to keep him going emotionally and mentally is a continual uphill struggle. He's constantly in pain, but paracetamol doesn't touch it. Every single day I agonise about how he's going to get this operation because he cannot go on with his life without it, but we cannot afford to pay for it privately. It's made me ill too. I find it incomprehensible that NHS England considers this operation a cosmetic procedure. It's so much more than that. My son cannot breathe, walk or move forward with his life without this operation. We urgently need change. Thank you. Thank you to Lynn, Sandra and Lizzie for really powerful stories. Um, do any, any of you have any questions for the three of them who have been very brave and courageous to stand up and talk about their own personal stories? Do any of you have any questions related to that or any comments that you wanted to share with us at this stage? Why are the NHS being so stubborn? <laughs> um, we will come on to that, um, but that I'm sure is a, a very, very important point. Where we're talking about today. Have any of these children actually managed to secure any funding privately or otherwise? No. No. I, I think we're all very moved by what we've just heard. Um, I think the change is coming. Um, and we can talk about more about that later. Um, what I'd like now to do is to move the meeting to the next uh, part of the discussion, which is to talk about the history of intervention and the different interventions available. And this will be given by Professor Abu Nadu, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon from Birmingham, and also in a moment by Mr. Sean Marvin, who you've already heard speak, who's sitting at the front, is from Sheffield. Open. Thanks, Evan. Um, I'm slightly nervous to be talking to you all and privileged as well. Nervous because about 25 years ago I was standing in this very room waiting to find out whether I'd be allowed to be a surgeon. This is where we received the results from 
but of the Royal College of Surgeons. But I'm very privileged today to be in your company uh, on really two accounts because in the last 25 years, performing pector surgery has been the most rewarding and valuable surgery for me because it's so life transforming. I'm also privileged because together I feel that we can actually make the change that's needed to get this service back up and running. So thank you for this opportunity to, for me and my partner in crime, Sean, to, have a, to share a few thoughts with you about the historical perspective and the types of treatment. And I think the history is important because some of the messages from it are still relevant today. And, you know, Pectus was first captured in an image by Leonardo da Vinci in 1510. And you can see here an elderly patient with a very minor pectus. It wasn't long after before the symptoms were appreciated by a, a Swiss botanist and doctor who noted symptoms in a seven-year-old child, a son of a nobleman. Um, and all I can say here is thank God for Google Translate, because this is a transcript from that first journal, okay? Uh, the Journal of Rare, New, and Admirable, Astonishing Medical Observations, published in 1594. And the title of this article was, An Innate Bending of the Breastplate with Ribs Causing Breathing Problems. So even then, the impact of pectus was appreciated. And of course, there were multiple stories describing symptoms after that. Uh, more latterly, by a British physician called Coulson, who in his book on chest wall dis disorders describes very nicely the symptoms of a young girl who was suffering with pectus. But he went on then to recognize that it actually ran in the family. Okay? And you know, many of the siblings were affected by this. You'd also see at that time the only treatment that they could offer was exercise. So it wasn't really until the 1900s before surgical treatment came into play. And one of our great pioneering German forefathers of thoracic surgery, Sarva, basically was the first person to successfully surgically treat pectus. Okay? He was famous also for in, uh, inventing the negative chest, uh, negative uh, chamber, which was allow allowed us to do this type of surgeries. He invented many of the surgeries and instruments that we still use today in thoracic surgery. So he had a patient uh, who was the son of a gentleman who earned a watchmaker factory. And the, the, the young man couldn't work because he was so breathless and had such bad syncope. So, what Sarva did is he removed the lower end of the breastplate with the ribs on one side. Quite a dramatic surgery for the 1900s. But the symptoms of this young man resolved. He was able to work and he even got married. And I think we all recognize these stories even today of how surgery actually transforms a person's life. Later, rather than just resection of the breastplate, he cut smaller sections of the ribs and lifted the breastplate up. And in those days, patients would have to have these external braces that would hold the breastplate forward and would be stuck in bed for six to eight weeks. In the 1960s, this then moved on. And rather than using an external stabilization, they placed a bar behind the breastplate. And this became the norm in an operation known as the modified ravage, which is still performed today. And this is where, if you imagine the ribs growing down and inwards, small sections on either side are removed to allow the ribs to move upwards. And the breastplate, which is curved down, you take a small wedge of it out, so I'm not being rude to you, uh, uh, and then this allows you to lift up the breastplate. And then this is either fixed with a bar or a plate or various techniques to fix it. So this is what the ravage operation is all about. And this remained very static till the 1980s when a South African surgeon working in America, Donald Ness, um, a, a lovely man if you've ever met him, very, very uh, down to earth, 
While he was performing the ravage, noticed how flexible the chest wall was. And he thought, said, well, why am I cutting all of this out? It's so malleable, why can't I stretch it? And that's when the NAS procedure was invented and thousands of people across the world have, have had the procedure thanks to him. And so I'm going to hand over to Sean, who's going to talk a little bit more about this and a few other procedures. So, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here in front of so many parents and young people who I remain an advocate for as a pediatric surgeon. Um, and this is my Victorian alter ego who said over a hundred years ago in the TV drama, The Nick, uh, we live in extraordinary times with endless possibilities. Nothing has changed. We still live in a time of endless possibilities for Pectus, and I'll hopefully uh, show you some of the ideas that we know about uh, currently. But um, uh, as, as we've seen, um, I'll just move that on, that this deformity has been known about for a long time, and attempts to correct it have been made, um, of course, with uh, surgery, because we are surgeons. And this is the, the modern version of the ravage repair, showing you a, a polypropylene mesh holding the stern forwards. Um, so uh, uh, that was preceded by uh, metal bars that you've heard about that were put behind the stern to hold it forwards after an open surgery. They were very thin, or you could almost bend them with your fingers. Um, and as you've heard, Donald Nuss uh, uh, made this amazing discovery about this potential space behind the sternum and the malleability of the chest wall. And he was on a flight when sitting next to him was a guy called Walter Lorenz, uh, who ran, had a medical instrument company and he said he needed a stronger metal bar. And he said, I'll make that for you. So Lorenz was a company that developed it. The, the much stronger uh, stainless steel bar. Um, he recognised in us that the ravage might be uh, a sledgehammer to crack a nut and that he developed his technique initially with great heroism, just poking into that potential space with the instruments that were developed. And he curved the bar according to the chest shape um, and then flipped it. And it popped up, like knocking out the, the dent in the side of a car door. It's that flexible. Um, and he's now just recently been recognised as one of the world's great contributors to children's surgery by the American Association of Pediatrics Section on Surgery. And there is a long list of very eminent uh, surgeons, not just American, from around the world, but um, just to where those red lines are, you can see a couple of other names. Alex Haller, described the Haller Index, and Mark Ravitch. So, um, people have been trying to crack this nut for a long time. Um, so there are variations on Nuss's technique. Uh, Pilgard in Denmark has got his shorter, uh, flatter bar. Um, but as you can see, Multiple bars have been tried, and there's lots of other variations on the NUS technique. Uh, I don't think we really know quite yet what is the best technique. But it is a notorious operation, of course. The heart is very nearby. Elevating the sternum seems like a good idea. Some try it, but observing it with a telescope is now considered the standard, but we're still developing techniques. One technique developed by the American pediatric surgeon uh, Michael Harrison is to surgically implant a magnet onto this, under the skin, over the sternum, wide around the sternum, and then, and then you wear an external brace, which is another magnet uh, the results of this have not been completely satisfactory, but it's 
uh, an idea which has been tried out and it may well be further developed in the future. And that brings us back to the, uh, the vacuum bell. Um, reports of its uh, effectiveness uh, are variable, but maybe we just haven't been doing it right. Uh, maybe we should be using it younger, or maybe we should be giving more support for the individuals who are using this technique. Send them all to Joel, I say. Yeah, come on down. <laughs> yeah. It's great to meet you all here. I'm delighted that the British Association of Pediatric Surgeons are joining together with the Society for Cardiac Thoracic and, and we're, we're uh, supporting and advocating surgery for practice in all of you. Um, sorry, um, that's just to remind me that this is sometimes congenital um, and possibly uh, it is, it, it is congenital in all cases, it's just not manifest until later years of life and becomes very apparent uh, in the early adolescence with a growth spurt. And just to remind us that the club foot was a deformity, congenital deformity, treated by surgeons heroically with less than satisfactory results until Ponsietti came along and said, why don't we just manipulate and stretch it back into the normal position, which is now the standard for deformity of the feet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle, for giving us some insight into the treatments. Um, do, has anyone got any questions for both uh, the clinicians about the treatments used for pectus deformities of the chest? I just offer the lady at the back of the orange top who had a question earlier. That's, does your question still relevant? Um, kind of. So, um, so I've got a child who's got a genetic condition as well. We didn't discover that until um, we found the pet disappeared. Um, I've also got a younger child that um, looks like he may be developing pectus. Obviously, I know what, what to look for now. Um, I suppose with the vacuum bell, um, at what age would you bring that forward to, us, to somebody and say, look, this, my older son has this, I think my younger son has this. Um, at what point would you wait to go to the doctor? Would you do that now, knowing what it is, or would you wait until it's further developed? And at what age would they be uh, eligible for, say, the vacuum belt? Good question. As was said earlier, earlier uh, it's not an area of my expertise. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't used it. Um, and I, I think we need to and you are going to tell us when to use it and how yeah okay thank you yeah we can let the speakers going to cover it so um, uh, I don't know but parents and, and young people uh, are so important in giving us the answers here same question there yeah any other questions? De Deborah at the back. Deborah at the back? Yeah. Late, of course, but. <laughs> De Deborah at the back is present at the British Association of Orthopedic Surgeons. Yes, I'm so. Have you here and thank you. No, no, my pleasure. And I arrived just as you were showing that into the slide of the revolution in paediatric management for the Ponsetti treatment for club foot. We've also been using braces for spines to correct the growing skeleton. And so anything you know, that you say about maybe potentially manipulating the vulnerable or adaptable cartilage to the shape you want it to be is inherently where we should be going. Thank you. Very timely entrance. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? I was just... Sure. I was just going to say that you didn't really cover uh, bracing in that, um, but I, I assume it's covered under the manipulation uh, microphone. Um, 
Yes, I apologise. Um, I, I didn't talk about that. It's fairly standard now to offer a, a bracing for Karen Alton, the orthotics department of any hospital in England would ordinarily be able to uh, make um, themselves a, a brace. Um, many of the orthotics departments are insourced into the NHS or private companies. Um, so um, you shouldn't be denied uh, a brace um, from any age. You shouldn't be. Um, and uh, furthermore, I, I have done surgery for current health and most of the ravage, but also the Abrahamson, Abrahamson technique, which is a metal bar under the skin, but uh, over the bone, uh, the sternum, and pressing it down that you then have to remove. So, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of other variations out there. If, does it depend on which operation you do as to the type of recovery? Because what's crossing my mind is if you're suddenly popping um, a ribcage out after it's been compressed for such a long period, does that also cause the patient issues in how in, having to cope? Because I'm assuming that not everything goes back to normal immediately and there are other challenges that have to be met. So does gradual um, trump immediate? If, and is there an optimum period when you should try and do one or the other? Yeah, that's, um, I'm, I'm sure you're right. Um, gradual would be better. And the younger you are, um, might be better. We know that if you do pectus surgery on pre-adolescence, the outcomes are less than satisfactory and recurrence is higher. And there's also a risk of other complications that, we got, that um, I've not mentioned. But uh, I, I, I'm sure that, uh, that you're right. Um, and that's where the magnetic attraction technique might might be a benefit, ultimately. Um, so um, I, I I think that the chest cage is flexible though for for many years. Babu, would you like to comment on what it's like in older uh, patients? How flexible is it? Uh, flexibility is very variable, um, and you, we make that assessment. Uh, but in answer to the recovery between the two types of treatment, the nurse tends to be more painful initially. Uh, that's why we generally use an epidural. Um, though, of course, you know, in the ravage of multiple fractures, we think that that would be more painful, but generally overstretching is more painful. But in the long run, there's no difference. Yeah, when I, when I stretch out my kidneys in the yoga class, Gradual is definitely better. And, um, but um, uh, on the points of pain um, and recovery, uh, in North America, there's new techniques, um, which, because they're so afraid of epidurals, a very high risk thing, epidural. Technically, it requires you to be in a certain place, a uh, high dependency setting. They've developed um, freezing the nerves, cryoanalgesia. I don't think that's been done in the UK. Um, and it, 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 the certain centres in America are now claiming to be able to do day case pectus bars. So it's still, we're still behind the curve on, on all of this, and we've been halted from learning and catching up. We use, we use, we use cry, you know, especially for one, yeah. and it's amazing. I for think for back to, uh, special in that Where, Whereabouts? I use it in London and... Uh, oh, I, I use it routinely. You were using it routinely, John. Interesting. I had clients. You did. Fascinating, yeah. No, no child has had it as far as I'm aware, unless you've done some younger ones. It presumably just as infected. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, so, I'm 30 years old and I had first surgery when I was 27. <coughs> I had two nurses procedures because the first one failed. Uh, it was in Belgium, because I'm from Belgium. Um, and I, it was with an epidural, but the, the team failed giving me the epidural. Oh so I fell on a stretcher with a needle inside my spine, and they removed it. So I had a surgery with no pain control at all. So when I woke up, um, I went 
to die because it was too painful. And I had to wait a year to have the redo surgery because COVID uh, hit the world. And I went to uh, Dr. Bell Josiewski uh, in Phoenix, and she did the surgery. So I had one single bar, and in four days after my surgery, my chest collapsed again with the bar. And so now I have three bars inside my chest. This is my second year with the three bars, and I'm gonna have them removed in one year. And the second surgery was with cryovation, and it's a total game changer on the game control. So my question is why, um, for patients, do still surgeons use one single bar when it's um, uh, obvious that having many bars is better to hold the pressure of the chest wall? Yeah, very interesting. I'm not a physicist, but the, the basic principle is you spread the load, the more bars you put in, the less pressure there is, the less likely perhaps there is of the bar flipping on them. I think that we all need to learn to do that. I, I, I was just bringing in uh, two bars into my practice before we had to stop. Any, any other experts want to comment on multiple bars? Uh, have you, have you used multiple bars? I have in select You're right, I quite concur with your arguments that initial practice was one bar, but increasingly moved to two, especially in the older population, there's more pressure on, on the system. Um, so I think it is fairly routine now. Sure. Sure. Could you let me use that shot? Yes, I'm going to do that. I think about the multiple bar. It all depends on your weight. If you're 60 kilo and above, you probably need two. If you're more than that, if you add it, maximum I use is three. But more bar, more pain. It has to be as your deformity is. Some people have a deformity from, start from, yes, uh, from a notch to down, they probably need three. But if you just have lower third, one bar should be sufficient, but it all depends on your deformity and your body weight. Mm. Yeah, very interesting insight. Thank you. Any other comments on multiple bars? I shake your hand uh, going through all of that. Carl. Yeah. Oh. So I'm currently with some of the pediatric surgeons in Glasgow. Um, the cryotherapy is very um, interesting thought, and, and it's maybe something. It sounds like a great solution, and the answer is it probably is for a lot of people, but it does come with a price. So, and some patients will have very, very debilitating long-term uh, problems when the nerves regenerate. You can get very nasty symptoms, so that like your clothes make you feel like you're burning and such like. So it is a balance. You may get some benefit in the short term about good, better pain relief with less strong and analgesia, and that's a huge attraction, which believe me, we as surgeons like the idea of that. But the price may be that the occasional patient will end up with a lifelong debilitating other problem. So it's not, it's not a freebie. So I think people shouldn't just think that this is a cure-all and why aren't people just doing it routinely. Thank you. On cryoanalgesia, I had cryoanalgesia when I had my surgery in the and it was perfect for me. I suffer from chronic pain, and painkillers were never going to be helpful for me after surgery. So cryoanalgesia was perfect for me, in that it gave me numbness for a long period of time. It was 2018 when I had my surgery, and had I got all the feeling back in my chest? No. But it was what I needed, and I don't think it would be appropriate for everyone. And it does have its drawbacks, but it definitely does have its benefits as well. She has three bars in. <laughs> in the interest of time, I think we will uh, wrap up that part of the session. Just thank you again, Sean and Abby, for the great. heard about some of the different treatments we have to offer um, patients or young people with pectus deformities of the chest. Um, 
as an important part of the journey and why we're here today is about showing the evidence, the efficacy of the treatments that we have to offer. And we have one of the world's experts um, who's very kindly agreed to join us online uh, through Zoom, so maybe bear with us with the technology just to make sure it, it, it works. But Dawn Yaroszewski is one of the uh, leading experts who put in a lot of the evidence that is available for clinicians to use about the efficacy of treatment in terms of both physiological and psychological um, impact it has on patients and why we should be doing these treatments. So we're honoured that she's going to be joining us from the Mayo Clinic in America, um, uh, internet line permitting. So <laughs> may I introduce to Dawn Jaroszewski. Well, welcome. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's uh, early in the morning here. I think it's mid-afternoon for you guys. Um, nice to join you from the other side of, of the world. I appreciate the uh, uh, invitation to join you guys. This talk is going to be something that's uh, very close to my heart. I, um, you know, you guys struggle a lot more than I do with trying to get practice coverage. And I know that it's, it's a huge fear of mine that the insurance companies in the U.S. are going to follow what's happened there and, and trying to deny what we all know as surgeons and patients is a life-changing operation. So we're going to talk just a little bit about um, my screen's off. Sorry, it's freezing. Just a sec. There we go. Um, the cardiopulmonary aspects of practice. And so when we look at a CT scan, when we look at a patient, you know, we see this guy and we see this huge deformity and we see the scan and we see the body, you know, crushed almost in two with the heart completely distorted to one side, sometimes the liver going to the other side, you know, it seems completely obvious, right? That this is a problem. So how can we sit there and argue that there's not a problem here? You know, does PE cause a problem? You know, does it affect the patient negatively? Does surgery offer a cardiopulmonary benefit? And that's the question that keeps coming up over and over and over and over again that everyone keeps arguing. And so it's like, why, why do we keep arguing this point? Well, part of it is because the literature of what's published is so confusing. Mm -hmm. And so if you look just at meta-analysis, and so what are meta-analysis? So meta-analysis are papers that are put together by quote unquote experts where they have done summaries of studies where they've said, okay, well, these are the only important studies out there that should be looked at. And they published those and said, okay, all these papers put together, give us an answer. And so, Laura Sosky, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we're just struggling with the volume at the back of the room. Um, and as I said, I, th I think it's from our end. Is there any any way you could maybe speak a little bit louder from your okay. side? Right. So um, the literature is very confusing. And so we have these meta analysis where authors have done summaries of papers that they think are relevant that are most important. And so you have authors that are taking different sects of pa papers on one end saying, oh, pe Pexis is beneficial. You absolutely need surgery. And then on the other side, taking some of the same opposite stu studies saying, oh, no, absolutely. Pexis has absolutely no benefit. And so you have these two ends of the spectrum going back and forth, which makes it so confusing. So why is there so much discrepancy in these outcomes? Well, these are my theories, right? I'm going to talk to you about these reasons of why I feel that people, and certainly your government agency, has gone through what's in the literature, why there's so much discrepancy out there. Number one, outcomes of surgery. A lot of things get included. Outcomes in surgery don't always have compression completely resolved, and we'll talk about that. Number two, when you test the patient after surgery makes a huge difference in when outcomes of what those outcomes show. 
Number three, there's a huge difference among patients and defects. Where the location is, how deep it is, the effect of the cardiac compression on that defect, the age of the patient, and what type of surgery they have affects outcomes. And so when you look at patients, they come in all different shapes, depths, locations, how long, how wide. Everything about a patient is different. No one patient is the same. So why should the patient's practice affect them exactly the same as another patient? If we look at these slides, I'm sorry, I can't get rid of this Zoom thing off my screen. Um, so this is three different patients. So if you look at their CT scans here and their echoes up here, where the compression is here on the echo is very different in these three patients. This patient has very mild, minimal compression on his right heart. This patient has some compression right here, just at the very beginning of his heart on the right atrium. This patient has compression at the very bottom. So let me show you this next slide. The patient in the middle that had compression right here, this guy actually has an echo that would be very similar to a patient that you would see that would come in in an emergency situation with constrictive pericarditis. That's almost like a tamponade. That's a very severe case. That's something that would be a big problem. He actually has a reversal of flow in his heart back into his liver. Very different from the other patients. We see that over and over. And we actually did a study looking at a group of patients. You have reversal of flow into the liver in a whole group of these patients that have compression in the front part of their heart. Very different from patients that have compression further down and lower. And you get 100% normalization of flow in all these patients. This group of pectus patients are completely different than other pectus patients. What about age? So age of patients is very different. So when you start looking at how age affects patients, it matters. Very different in a little baby versus a guy that's 73. How stiff your chest is how much flexibility it has. If you look at cardiopulmonary exercise testing in groups of patients, look at these three areas. Mean age of 15, only 33% of those patients had reduced exercise fitness. Mean age in the 20s, 53% had reduced exit, exercise tolerance. Mean age in the 30s, now we're looking at 68% of patients have, having abnormal exercise tolerance. So it appears that the older patients are getting, the more the deformity is starting to affect them, the more their ability to kind of, uh, you know, counteract the effects, the body's compensatory mechanisms. Um, as I say, the ability for your body to be able to bounce back is becoming less and less. Here's a study that we did looking at before pre-op and post-op, the output of the heart. RV output in our mean adults greater than 30 years increased by 65% in the adult patients. Big, dif big difference. But what about type of surgery? Does this make a difference? Well, if you look at the type of surgery, NUS versus Ravage, it's a very different type of surgery. NUS, you're putting bars in and just lifting. So you're keeping the cartilage in. In Ravage, you're cutting, letting that cartilage regenerate, but you get some calcification of the chest, so you get increased rigidity. That's gonna affect some of the flexibility of the chest wall. The NUS procedure, when you have those bars in, you're gonna have pretty significant restriction with bars in. So when you start looking at testing, it makes a big difference when you do that testing. If you check pulmonary function on a patient while they still have bars in on a NUS, 
you're going to get really bad results. As a matter of fact, they're going to be as bad, maybe worse than when the patient tested pre-op. So if you look at studies, Ravage is going to be better after surgery. Nuss is worse. You have to wait to test these patients out long-term after bars are, re- are out. And so studies show that. And so if you include studies of NUS that have bars still in, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna be good outcomes. If you wait and show them after their bars are out, they will be better. And so including those studies skews, it makes the outcomes confusing. How about the question of whether or not the surgery actually fixed the problem? This one drives me crazy. I redo a ton of patients. I see this all the time. This is a lady I just did, single bar. If you look at her CT scan here, this is the bottom of her sternum. This is her heart here. She still has compression of her heart. If you test this person, her test is not going to show her any better. This is her heart. Her heart is still compressed. She is not fixed. She is not gonna test any better. And someone's gonna write a paper and say that the NUS procedure doesn't make this patient any better and that there's no reason to fix this patient because the surgery doesn't fix or fix practice problems. This happens over and over again. And remember this scenario because I'm gonna bring it up again a little bit later in our talk. This is a patient I redid. I put three bars in her. Anybody knows anything about me as a surgeon, I'm a multiple bar person because you have to get the whole sternum up. And sometimes they look fine from the outside, but they're not fixed on the inside and they still have compression. And if the whole problem with the practice is compression and you don't fix that problem and you really didn't get the problem. Here's a paper that just got published recently out there, 19 patients, no improvement after practice repair. If you look, this is their their model patient, single bar. If you look carefully on their x-ray, here's their practice deformity right here. Look at post-op, here's their practice deformity. Right here, it's still there. You go back to my lady. Same problem, practice deformity is still here. Of course, they don't see any improvement. They didn't fix the problem. Now, I don't know if all their patients are like that, but the biggest problem with this study is there's only 15 patients and it's not a large enough sample size to actually have a valid study. We use TEEs on all of our patients. This is your practice. This is your heart. This is what it looks like when patients aren't being compressed. You need to make sure you don't have compression, any compression left if you're truly going to fix a patient. This is your velocity changes. Pre-op, this is your flow through the heart. This is your flow afterwards. You should see these kind of changes. You should see these improvement flows through your patients. You have to make sure you don't have any residual compression at the end of a repair. We use 3D echo. We look at improvement in volume. This is just a study on a small number, looking at 100 patients, but you should see a huge improvement in the amount of blood amount of space in your patients. This is how you see improvement post-op. This is how you prove that practice is better. You should have these kind of numbers. 30%, 24% increase. Remember in our older patients, 65% increase. Much bigger number in the older patients, but much bigger deficit in those older patients too. How about cardiac strain? So strain is not what you think stress, strain is efficiency. So the the myofibrils 
of the heart, they're, they're elongated. So when they contract, when they go this way. So when the heart gets distorted, the efficiency of the ability of the heart to contract gets off. So we show that when you fix the pectus, the efficiency of the ability to, of the heart to contract is significantly improved. And it's not just how deep it is. Sometimes even the most mild looking practices, look at this guys, before and after echo. Look how much wider, look how much more volume this patient has. He just had so much compression on his heart, but he had a big, wide, flat defect. So every patient's a little bit different. And so even the most mild looking deformities you wanna investigate, because everyone is different. And so what are some of the other issues that contribute to literature? All these small studies. So there's only five studies out there with more than 50 patients enrolled or if you don't count controls, published on before and after post, I put NUS, but it's really post-repair cardiopulmonary outcomes. That's hardly any studies. Everything else are these little small smidge bits. If you look at what's a statistical powered study, it's 100 patients, right? You need 100 patients to have a decent study. You can go to 50 if you want to accept error, a lot of error. And so when you look at what's published out there, it's very small studies. And so what's out there? These are all these negative studies. 15 patients, no difference. This one that I just was talking about earlier, 19 patients. And if you actually read the paper, it says they have 45 patients but then only 19 patients actually did the study. So it's really only 19 patients in their study. Our study, we started 392 patients. We followed 130 patients so far out post-op. These are midterm because they still had bars in and the 130 when we tested them in. We got them at the time before we pulled bars. Significant improvement in every single parameter. Their O2 consumption, O2 pulse, their VO2. Now we are in the process of doing the long-term follow-up, which hopefully I will have in the next year of trying to get some of these patients to come back. Um, we did a subgroup analysis. We were only able to get 39 of those, but again, in the TEE, significant improvement in stroke volume in all of those patients. In O'Keefe's patients, 67 patients, significant improvement, O2 pulse, respiratory function, uh, objective improvement, exercise tolerance. Magard, uh, improvement in FEV1, cardiac impact index, all of them, they had controls, so they had patients that didn't have surgery. This is a nice study. It was a little bit smaller, but they had patients that were matched in age that they followed through time also. All of those looking at, you know, the same changes as far as stuff. All of them significant proof. Uh, Neveri, this is a ravage study. Um, 70 adults, whoops, sorry. Um, Post-op aerobic tolerance significantly improved, VO2 pulse improved. The only thing that was negative on the, because it was a ravage, is they didn't have significant improvement in lung. And sometimes you see that in the ravage just because you get a little bit of the calcification, a little bit of restriction in the lung, lung the chest wall because of the decreased movement, um, and a little bit more rigidity of the chest wall with the ravage procedure. So what about this study, Castanelli, 59 patients, um, only negative study out there that's large. What about this study? So interesting, you got to look at it a little bit closer on these studies. So mean age of the patients was 15. 
Single bar, 88%. Uh, Haller index wasn't reported on these. They used funnel sagittal in image index, which is one I'm a little less familiar with, but it was abnormal. Um, only two of these patients had abnormal exercise tests. 32 of the patients out of 59 were greater than 100%. So most of the patients did not have any abnormalities. Um, they also had significant increase in the weight of their patients. And they did not follow exercise. So they, they thought there was significant deconditioning due to the weight increase. Um, so it was hard to, hard to read the outcomes of this study to know. Um, they were normal to begin with. They all, they all had a significant increase in how much weight they had gained. Um, but only kind of study out there that didn't show a significant improvement. What about quality of life? Lots of studies out there. I won't go through all of them, but you know, improved self-esteem, quality of life, body image, all of those that have operated on patients, no patients, had a patient, been a patient, know the, the life-changing impacts of this surgery. We do a survey at the time of bar removal, and I can tell you that 99.5% of patients will check that box and say that surgery was worth it, it made their life better, and they would absolutely do it again and recommend it to other patients. And so to the answer to this question, does PE cause you know, a medical problem? Does it affect patients negatively? Does it offer cardiopulmonary benefit? Um, I think there's absolute evidence that it does in a large percentage of patients. It seems that that percentage increases as the patients increase in age and that the evidence is clear that the majority of patients with cardiac compression that are adequately corrected will get significant benefit from surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really insightful presentation and it gave, gave us a, a, all a great um, understanding of the evidence behind the benefit for surgical correction, impressing on the fact that it needs to be done correctly um, and also actually some of the evidence, the poorly constructed evidence that is sometimes used to, to, to justify why sur surgery is not um, being used. Are there any questions from clinicians or patients or family members in the audience? Uh, for Dr. <laughs> Just shout at you. Hi, Dawn. See you, Hunt. Um, um, Dawn, you alluded to the way the surgery is being performed. Do you think that's a relevance, um, the type of surgery, the number of bars, et cetera, et cetera? What's your attitude towards specialist centers performing thoracic surgery, uh, performing repetitive surgery? Um, so I think that, that you need to know how to perform the surgery. Um, and I don't know that, I think that, that, Surgeons that can do the surgery need to be doing the surgery. What was the answer? We could, really... oh, sorry, I was just between me and her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share it to the audience, Dawn. Your, vo your voice is quite quiet. So, so really, it's, the surgeons need how to know how to do the surgery. The point, I guess, the question asked for the audience is the volume of practice is important to surgery. It's surgeons, it's a general kind of thing about what we do. And I think the evidence is really that surgeons should be doing a, a certain number of, of cases to develop experience. And that's not just the surgeons, it's the group. It's the cardiologists, it's the physiologists, mm -hmm. it's the physical therapists, it's everybody working as a group to develop the best practice. And mm -hmm. Joel will be uh, alluding to some of this a bit later. Are there any other questions while we have such an honored and eminent guest with us? Hi, right, Simon Kendall here. I'm the guy that invited you with Joel, so thank you very much for talking. Um, we've got a pector surgeon in the audience, Chris Satter from Stoke, um, and he's only shared this week with me a paper um, about the different scales of deformity, whether it just affects the sternum and how the whole thorax is skewed. Um, in the evidence, have you got any feel for if anyone is separating pectus into different categories, different classifications? Um, well, I know Martinez Farrow has tried to do that with his cardiac MRIs, um, looking at type A, B, you know, B, C, you know, those type things, looking at car 
oppression issues. Um, it's not always so simple um, because what you think will be, uh, we tried to do that actually with the hepatic vein paper, you know, saying, oh, this, this type of compression is 100% gonna cause the hepatic vein injury because because we were, we were trying to define that and it, it didn't necessarily work out that way like we expected. So I, I think it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but, you know, we, we, you want to have that definition. So you can, you can say, okay, these patients are the 100% the ones that have to have surgery if you have this, right? So that for insurance purposes, you can define it just like we do for, you know, like the Demister scale, scale for, um, you know, reflux disease. Um, and, and we haven't come up with that. And, you know, we, we need to, to try to make it easier to get insurance through, yeah. but then you, you have outliers. Yeah. So, so going forward for England and the UK, it will be important to record those measurements so we can review outcomes possibly. Uh, maybe, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I, I think the ideal scale would be to look at something like the Meester, where you have multiple things. You have, you know, you ha you have a numeric score, right? You have an echo score, you have an exercise score, you have a radiologic score, and each of these is a number, and then then the number adds up to a total score. And if a patient has a score above ten or above five, they they're they're surgical, right? You know, okay. symptoms is this many points, this is this many points. And that's what we do for reflux surgery um, okay. in thoracic. And, you know, I think patients should have a score level above this and each thing should be weighted into that score. Um, now, personally, I think everybody should be fixed, but. Yeah, Dawn, thank, thank you very much. And thank you for talking to us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I will move on to the, the next session. We've heard about some of the different treatments and the evidence behind it. It would be really powerful to hear about some patients and stories about those who've gone through the surgery and the impact that it had on them. I've got quite a loud voice, so <laughs> that should help. Um, so, you've heard earlier on the physiological and psychological challenges that many of our Peptis patients have been experiencing, but we've also had some really uplifting uh, stories in our book where people have managed to access both non-surgical and surgical treatments and their lives have really been quite transformed as a result. Um, I think it's really important as well to highlight that surgical treatments can occasionally fail. Um, and I do want to mention um, there is a devastating case of Angela Whiteman's <coughs> daughter Kay, Angela's in the audience with us today, who tragically died as a result of major complications to her surgery, um, which was the NUS surgery. And, Actually, Angela's brought along, she's written a book about her journey. Unfortunately, we only connected after the book had gone to print. But I think it's really fair that we represent everybody in this room. And there are copies of the book um, downstairs. The Nuss and Ravitch procedures, are, they're tough. Uh, they're, they're difficult to get through. Reco recovery isn't easy. However, in the vast majority of cases, we are finding that patients' lives are being positively transformed. A recurrent theme in our book of stories has been parents questioning why on earth their children have not been offered the relatively cheap option of bracing far sooner on their pectus journeys. For pectus excavatum, the vacuum bell can be applied for four to eight hours uh, daily and it can significantly improve the dip in a child's chest, um, but better that it's used at an earlier age. Um, if only more children could access the vacuum bell at a cost of around about £2,000, it really could prevent them from developing, developing uh, the debilitating heart and lung conditions that so many older patients are experiencing. Uh, and similarly, for cases of pectus carinatum, chest bracing could be extremely effective in correcting the condition over a relatively short period of time. 
and it's also quite cost effective. And one of our uh, PC patients, Ross uh, Cabry, who's come all the way from Northern Ireland today. Um, Ross, you made, you wrote your own story. Where are you, Ross? There you are. You made the point so brilliantly in your story, and it had to get mentioned in the foreword. Ross made the, do you want to make your own point? Or do you want me to cover it off? <laughs> I'll cover it off. He just said, well, why, when there are children with wonky teeth, they can get their teeth braced? And that comes at a cost of about three grand. It's cosmetic. It genuinely is cosmetic. And it's something that's not time bound. You can brace your teeth at 50. But kids who've got these devastating deformities cannot access a chest brace that's the same price. I mean, it's, it's bonkers, isn't it? So thank you for raising that so simply and effectively. Um, so. On that point now, actually, I would like to invite Sh uh, Ross's mum, Shauna, to the stage, who is going to share Ross's uh, journey and outcome with having had his peptis carinatum treated. Ross's story is slightly different to some of the other stories in the room because it's peptis carinatum. Um, plus we were at a window of opportunity, which I think Joel has recognised as somewhere between 10 and 16, um, so therefore he was able to look at early interventions. The difficulty for us, and I know technically surgery is still an option in Northern Ireland, although it's our experience that there hasn't actually been any. Um, not only has there not been any, there has been no bracing, no vacuum bell. Our experience is that you go on to a wait list that you languish on for an infinitum. And in reality for us when Ross, it was May and Ross was about 12 and a half years of age and he had developed, he was born premature but he had developed perfectly normally and lived a perfectly normal life. He was playing contact sport, having a great time at school and there were no real medical issues. He developed um, Karanatum where his chest was skewed to one side and it grew outward with a little bit growing inward. Um, we noticed it growing very quickly, so in the space of about 12 weeks, it went to almost four inches out of his chest. So it sat like a cone, effectively. So unlike some people being able to put a jumper on, and although they themselves suffer the condition um, and the psychological impact, he couldn't hide his. There was absolutely nothing as a boy he could do. It was there for all to see. His friends noticed it, and everyone noticed it. And because it had grown so fast, we were extremely worried. We, we initially had people telling us, has he got a tumour? Has he got a, his bones growing the wrong direction? We'd never heard of pectus. A friend of ours told us that we should refer him to a doctor very quickly, which we did. Our GP was very supportive, but he'd heard of pectus excavatum, but had never heard of this. Thank you. Afterwards, um, we couldn't get any assistance whatsoever. We got a referral through a colleague and friend to a hospital appointment and we were told effectively that he had a diagnosed condition of pectus carinatum, but there was very little that we could do about it unless we went down a private route for bracing. The surgery that we were told and was described to Ross was quite invasive. They indicated because of his particular condition it would result in breaking the sternum and potentially replacing it, um, which we thought was extremely severe in the circumstances, and that prompted us to look at other options. We wanted referred to the UK. We didn't know whether it was even available here. We hadn't heard of the condition, and we were told that wasn't available. And then we looked at a cross-border scheme, and we identified a doctor in Dublin who treated Ross, and we were very lucky to borrow the money to assist and to pay for his treatment. But it, it is an uplifting story. So Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Bryce Antell, who is at the Beacon Hospital in Dublin, he identified that Ross had asymmetrical predominant pectus carinatum. He had musculoskeletal changes, bilateral rib flaring and flattening, rounded shoulders and kyphosis. He measured him, he scanned him, he put him on a three-month pectus physiotherapy program to prepare him for a brace. Three months later, we had a bespoke brace fitted to Ross after they had frozen his chest. Um, and, and when I say frozen, I don't mean the um, extensive freezing, I mean just a local anaesthetic. And his chest was quite malleable because he was caught at the optimum time. 
and they, able, they were able to effectively reset all of the bones and then crank them into a tight brace. The bracing was quite significant because he had to wear the brace for 23 hours and 45 minutes a day, so he got 15 minutes to shower. And the first part of the program was that he wore that every day, all day, all night, for six months. Um, in that time, Ross's condition absolutely stabilised. Um, he was in a growth spurt, so they extended that by another three months. Um, and then over the summer period, he was allowed it off for a couple of hours per day, which he chose for his football training and um, for swimming with his friends in the summertime because it was quite difficult in the summertime. But it was relatively pain free compared to surgeries. And by the end of September, Ross was moving into a maintenance phase where he wore the brace um, to continue the setting of the, the resetting of the bones during his growth spurt and he had um, two to three hours a day release and that gradually increased. Now his condition is such that he doesn't wear the brace at all during the day and hasn't since Halloween and he is going to be off it completely in another four weeks which he only wears it at night at the moment. It's uncomfortable at night time but he learned how to adapt and the fear of surgery which had been instilled in him from the very first day meant that he was very very compliant because the fear that he could never play football again drove his compliance. Where he is now is such that he is now 14 so it happened at a time where he was getting very concerned about his appearance, he was getting very concerned because he couldn't hide it, it was having a psychological impact initially but not at the level I believe others have been subjected to. And I think that's because he got early intervention. I can tell you that the early intervention leaves Ross with a recovery of 97%. At the beginning, by the September, so the condition started in May, by the September when he was three to four inches um, out of his chest and this other bit had grown in inward, Ross struggled to breathe. He struggled with exercise, he had to finish his football and stop, he missed a whole year of football. He, um, his biggest concern was, although people could notice it, his biggest concern was he couldn't breathe and he'd been fit and healthy in school and now he wasn't fit and healthy anymore. As such, he's now fit and healthy again, he can breathe properly, his ribs have expanded enough for him to do everything that he did before and we understand that he may have a 20% regression when he's 17, but at the moment it doesn't look likely. So for us it's been a huge success story. Ross is now back playing football and very happy. And I think the fact that it wasn't available to us meant that we did our own research. I think it's shocking. I think it's horrible. Um, I really agree with what Lynn said. We were absolutely terrified frightened and traumatised when Ross first took this condition. We had no knowledge of it. I think GPs need to learn a lot more about it. I think there should be referrals made immediately to cardiothoracic surgeons. And I think all options should be put on the table for people. And it should be explained. When we went to Dr. Bryce and Tao, he within 10 minutes explained to Ross everything about his condition. And he scanned him with a 3D scanner so within an hour and a half, we, we went for coffee and came back again. He could see inside his body and outside his body. And then they measured him against the wall. Where he could see the changes himself against the measurements. And every time, every three months, when he was being reviewed, um, it was a few weeks at a time, four weeks at a time at the beginning, he could see the progression. So he could see, so within about 16 to 17 weeks, Ross looked perfectly normal again. And what I can say to you is, there are photographs, I think, up on the slides, but if not, that's what he looks like today, wow. which is absolutely perfect. Wow. And he doesn't have any concerns or issues. So I would advocate for absolute early intervention. Doctors should be looking for this condition between 10 and 16, and they should be intervening, whether it's Excavan or Caranam, because what I've heard around the room today is that early intervention prevents long-term problems and I think it should be funded. We are devastated that it wasn't funded. Um, my son has a friend who is a few years older. He hasn't been funded. He still has the condition and they don't have the means to pay for that. 
So we are advocating that there is a change in the system at home where bracing as an early intervention will prevent the NHS spending funds they don't need to spend on surgeries that are, in Ross's case and in many cases of PT, absolutely unnecessary if early intervention is done properly. I can't understand how the NHS in its current crisis could justify surgeries of 70, 80,000 pounds in, in those cases um, when bracing is available at a cost of three to five. So that's our story. And Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Um, I'm going to move on quickly now. I, I, I realise we are slipping time-wise. So, um, unfortunately, uh, because of the way that NHS is set up at the moment, uh, many people haven't had the benefit of bracing, and it's at this point that people have to consider the more invasive procedures of nurse and ravage, um, which I, these cost a huge amount. We're having to point funded, funded privately. Um, but surgery can really be transformative. Um, so I'm going to introduce a couple of speakers now, one of whom has had a very successful ravage procedure, and then we'll talk to Ellie, who's had the nurse. But firstly, um, welcome to Rachel, um, who had the ravage procedure. Am I allowed to mention your name or not? Oh, your, your age, sorry. I've got it on here, I've got it. Yeah, so it's, you know, I know it's a touchy subject for <laughs> um, no, but. Uh, Rachel had the procedure age 56. No, I'm, 50, I'm, I'm, I'm about to be a, a year old. Um, but, no, I had it eight months ago. So age 57. Yeah. yeah, which is, it also goes to show this isn't something that we're just talking about teenagers here. These conditions stay with people for a, a very long time. I'm afraid I'm going to have to relate to my notes because I'm not very good memory wise. <laughs> so, um, basically, um, my story is in the book as well, in Lynn's wonderful book. So, thank you so much, Lynn, for collating all this information. And forever, thank you, John. Um, basically, um, I'd just like to say that no one should live in shame, feeling grotesque, different, and unlovable. No one should live in pain long term with no hope of relief or hope for a good future, or a future at all. This is really the reality for many pectus sufferers, and however positively you try to live with it, it's there, it's impinging, undermining you, and it seems, it seemed to me, that there was absolutely no way out as time advanced. It's something I felt I couldn't escape, and time went on and on with no help. It's not cosmetic. This has to change, and currently as things are now, as we all know in the room, it's not on the NHS, and the NHS can't seem to help us. As you know, I'm 57, <laughs> and I've had the greatest fortune to have found my surgeon, Joel Dunning, after a lifetime of self-doubt and increased pain. My pectus excavatum began about 50 years ago and has remained undiagnosed until the last three years. Why was I different? There seemed to be absolutely no answer. Pectus excavatum distorted a most significant part of me, my chest. I felt that I didn't qualify as a woman. I had such an odd and unfeminine shape. I have a twin brother. He's totally unaffected. No one else in my family appeared to be affected. I was the odd one out. And I was born, it was one of the questions that came up earlier, I was born full term. I felt abhorrent, untouchable and unlovable. It affected the decisions I made throughout my life about relationships, about my activities, and even in my career. More than this were the physical effects, exhaustion. I lived many decades managing my diary very carefully, balancing work or social life around rest days just so I could cope. My chest shape was my best kept secret. I managed to keep it hidden pretty well, but living with any kind of facade is a very lonely life. I won't lie. If I had been diagnosed earlier, if I could have had surgery sooner, I could have taken much more spontaneous decisions. I would have lived with less fear, less pain, and been able to express myself more confidently, not hiding myself away. 
I also spent a great deal of my early income and my income through my life trying to manage other health complications that arose as a part of this. Um, and the thought of surgery, you know, when it came up, seemed impossible, petrifying. As I face many potential complications, not only my age, but I also have many numerous um, serious drug and food intolerances, and as well as type 1 diabetes. But my condition worsened in lockdown, the concavity not only increasing in depth, but also across my chest, coming further up and right across. And so it began to be clear that there was no alternative for me but to seek a surgeon. I encountered multiple dead ends and rejections. No one knew anyone who could help me, and then, cataclysmically, I discovered that surgery was now almost totally likely to be impossible, no longer being funded by the NHS. I refused to give up. Then, a complete and utter miracle. I found my surgeon, Joel Dunning. I was so very lucky. Joel performed the modified Ravitch about eight months ago in June 2022. This was only possible because my father was able to fund it due to Joel's extraordinary skill and relentless commitment to save and enable people like me to have surgery at Middlesbrough Hospital. He's changed my life. I'm going to cry. <laughs> he listened. He found solutions and built a team with the same vision. Andy McDonald, my anaesthetist, was also incredibly patient working with me ahead of surgery, and acupuncturist Robin Sunley, who was very kind and supportive in helping me combat both fear and pain around the surgery. I now have three synthes plates in my chest. Yeah, give a picture. Um, they look a bit like bicycle chains, but I think they're a necklace of raindrops. That's how I like to call it, my necklace of raindrops. I'm proud to say I am now the bionic woman. They have rebuilt me. I was in Middlesbrough for just under two weeks in the hospital for just four days and stayed locally just for the following week following discharge. My surgery took five hours. I didn't have cryoanalgesia and I did manage mostly with painkillers. At my age, recovery has taken some months, but I was up and walking the same day and even taking tentative steps on the beach just days later with my son. I'm so very grateful for this incredible opportunity I have been given. I carefully resumed swimming after three months and was up to my usual 40 lengths a day within five months. And I swim every day since, and will. <laughs> my life has changed. I had felt unable to grow as me within the body that I had that was constricting normal, easy breath. Now, I no longer lie awake at night, twisting and turning, massaging the whole of my chest, my sides, my back to relieve endless tension and pain. Now I've begun to enjoy better health. I have less severe intolerances, improved circulation, and better diabetic control, and above all, a greater confidence. I hope my story can be one of its last, of its kind, a fable. If we can go and get this pectus operations and help funded again on the NHS. I'm lucky I have two beautiful children, they're unaffected. And now I can hope for grandchildren. For those of you <coughs> waiting, wishing for surgery, let's get these surgeries, this help reinstated as soon as we can, so you too can live life to the full. Rachel, that was actually incredibly moving. Um, I wasn't the only one really concerned with that. Um, I'd now like to welcome Ellie. Before she comes up, I want to say a special thank you. Ellie's been helping with a bit of proofreading, correcting my spelling mistakes in the book. So thank you, Ellie. Um, and Ellie's going to take you through uh, her, her journey of going through a finesse procedure. In 2018, I had the NUS procedure at the age of 22. Since then, my life has completely changed and treatment has enabled me to live a life that was completely impossible before. 
I know that pectus excavatum was having a radical physiological effect on me, and I believe that the NUS procedure saved my life. I wish that I could share some of my pre-surgical scans and show you the extent to which my chest deformity was affecting my body, but like most people living with rare complex conditions, especially in the north of England, my scans are split over multiple hospitals across various trusts and they're pretty much inaccessible to me. As well as that, I never imagined I'd have to save my scans um, so as evidence to justify that they would prove that they could cause a health problem. It seemed so obvious to me that it was. I have Marfan syndrome and presented with pectus excavatum from a very young age. My chest began to look more severe as I went through puberty, but it was never mentioned at any of the hundreds of GP specialist appointments, consultations that I was having. And so I thought, there's no problem. There's nothing to be worried about. None of these other people are. I was 16 the first time I felt my chest falling in on itself. I have a very distinct memory of the pain of my bones collapsing in and feeling like my breath was being pulled out of my chest. The best way to describe it is like my chest was a broken plate that I could feel the pieces cracking and getting really fragile and every time it would collapse. I hope that this would be a one-off occurrence but unfortunately this was just one of many that would happen over the next six years. To look at, my pectus deformity always appeared quite severe, aside from the typical, typical concavity in the centre of my chest. Um, my entire right side was collapsed right up to underneath my collarbone. Whilst some women think that they might have the upper hand being able to disguise their pectus excavatum, this definitely wasn't the case for me as the right hand side of my chest was completely concave and barely any of my breast tissue was visible. Predictably, this caused irreparable damage to my self-esteem. Um, even now, low self-esteem is a dominant feature of my depression and even though I've made big improvements in the recent years, this is something that will always affect me. By the time I was 21, the constant collapsing of my chest was having a profound effect on my health. At the time, I was living at home, studying in another city away from my parents. I was unable to work a part-time job alongside my studies, and I couldn't walk any distance without losing my breath. The 10-minute walk to university wasn't possible, and I couldn't make it to the supermarket two streets away. I knew that after completing my degree, I would have to move home to be cared for by my parents. I knew I wasn't going to be able to work, and I was really scared for what was going to come next. Um, it was this, at this point of complete desperation and fear that I emailed Joel um, after having heard his name over and over and over again on a Facebook support group. I didn't hear about it from a GP or a consultant or an A&E doctor. I heard about him on Facebook, which is a real shame. After completing my master's degree, I'd had to move back home with my parents and I'd been declared unfit to work. My lung function was below 60%. And on um, MRI scans, or CT scans, I can never remember which, um, my heart looked like a banana, completely pressed into a different position because of my chest wall. On 31st of October 2018, I had the NUS procedure at James Cook. On the day of my surgery, my Haller index was 11.5, and I only had 11, I only had 1.7 centimeters between my heart, between my sternum and my spine. I was later told that in a normal person this is way over 20 centimetres and me and my family couldn't believe how lucky I was that I'd had the surgery. After the surgery I had three titanium bars in my chest and just felt incredibly lucky that I'd had the surgery before it had the chance to collapse any further. Since having the procedure, my health has changed dramatically in so many ways. The most obvious is that I can breathe again. I can remember in the days immediately after my surgery lying in my hospital bed having to teach myself how to breathe into my stomach again. It had been so long since I'd been able to do it that my body didn't do it automatically anymore and I, it felt ridiculous having to teach myself to breathe with my stomach after a year spent taking quick shallow breaths at the top of my chest. For the first time in my life I'm able to be active and I enjoy taking exercise classes, walking in the lakes and along the Cumbrian coast. I'm not quite as fast as everyone else. Um, and I do occasionally have to stop to catch my breath. But this is something I could never do, and it's part of my life now, which is so important to me. If you ask my friends and family, they'd roll off a myriad of ways they've seen my health improve since my surgery. 
For me, 2019 was, a const was filled with constant comments of, you look so well. Uh, I can't believe how healthy you look. Your skin's so much brighter. Your hair looks so healthy. The most obvious visible change has been the incredible amount of weight that I've gained. Having math and syndrome, I was painfully thin from a young age and despite trying a lot, was unable to put on any weight. Since 2018, I've put on well over three stone and it's ever increasing. And if you ask the people closest to me, they'd tell you that I look like a completely different person, a healthier, happier person. It was really interesting to hear from the Mayo Clinic that there is a link between having the surgery and an increase in BMI. I can certainly say that that's happened for me. Most importantly though, the overall improvement in my health means that I can live the life that wasn't possible to me before surgery. Whilst before I was declared unfit to work and forced by my circumstances to move home to my parents to be cared for, I now work full time and live independently from my family. Regardless of the NHS's stance, I know pectus excavatum was severely disabling me, leaving me isolated from my friends and the life I wanted to live. Now I do things not possible to me before, things that I always had the desire and potential to do, but was physically restricted from. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to wrap up now. Um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that the fact that we commissioning treatment on NHS England will incur costs. But what you truly get a sense of from reading all the stories in the book is that NHS England is currently squandering hundreds and thousands of pounds of unnecessary treatment. Uh, sticking plaster approaches um, is what is adopted by not treating the root cause of the, of the condition in the first place. Money is being wasted on repeated GP appointments dealing with the same issue time and again. Referrals to cardio and respiratory consultants for related conditions when nobody is treating the root cause. Cost of asthma treatment, and this has come up really consistently for people who don't have asthma, uh, they just don't have the right answer. Um, the cost of unnecessary even heart surgery in the case of a boy who his heart, his body, his chest was opened up to deal with a supposed heart condition. Once the space was created, they realised there was nothing wrong with his heart in the first place. I mean, that's just staggering. The lost revenue to the UK government of having an increasing group of people who can physically no longer work or are having to work part-time or in lower paid jobs because that's all they can physically manage and there are many of those in the room today. And the cost impact on mental health services now having to deal with the fallout of people struggling to cope with the fact that they don't feel listened to and that nobody cares. Please wake up NHS England and policymakers in government. Surely all the people in this room and many more besides deserve better than this. Surely every practice patient deserves to be granted a treatment pathway when they walk into their GP surgery, or at the very least, have a sense that they are speaking to someone who understands more fully about the condition. It would be brilliant to think we could have local treatment centres um, offering bracing treatments to younger children and referral options for older patients and those more severely impacted by this condition. A united and strategic approach would help so many and would see a far more efficient use of NHS England's precious resources. And finally, I would like to thank all the storytellers in the Pets of book for having the courage to speak up about their deeply personal journeys. It does really make the sober really reading. Take the time when you go home this evening. And I hope anybody in this room um, who feels they have a voice and the ability to make a difference to the lives of practice patients will read the book and then take some action, please. It is a human right for human, for practice patients to have access to healthcare and for people to feel they are being supported in living their best lives. Thank you.
just want to say a word of thanks to Joel. Um, I didn't get to say it in my talk speech earlier, but he kept myself and Ross and my husband sane during all of our treatment. He was very truthful and very candid. He was very honest about what was available and what wasn't available. And when we had a complete brick wall in Northern Ireland and had to go to Dublin, we didn't know about what was available in the rest of the UK. Joel, the entire way through the process, walked us through hand in hand. And although we weren't directly treated by him, I feel like he was the one that did all the heavy lifting. I want to say thank you to you today for raising this, for keeping it on the agenda, and for making it the street was possible for people and taking away some of our fear and anxiety, and for hope, hopefully creating a pathway that means other people don't have to do this in the future. Joel later about all the amazing work he's done. Um, thank you, Sean and team for, for coming today. As you've noticed, we're slightly overrunning. Um, I've let the program run a little bit because I think it's really important to hear from all of you who've made the effort to come up today. So um, we're just going to slightly juggle the program around just for some people that just need to disappear. We are here at the Royal College of Surgeons um, of England. We have support of all the Royal Colleges around um, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, but I just, I, I sit with some of the team here at the Royal College of Surgeons of England and they've been greatly supportive of what we are trying to do. I would just like the Vice President Tim Goodacre to come and just say a few words about the importance of this issue and their support in trying to achieve a fair and equitable access for all of you as patients and family members. So Tim is the Vice President of the Royal College of Surgeons. Tim, thank you. Thank you very can I say this is a very unprepared uh, address, uh, but it's something that is dear to my heart, and I want to explain that in a moment. It's an enormous privilege to have you here as both a patient group and a, a clinical representation group of all sorts of uh, domains, uh, and to have heard the expertise that's, that's come to the fore about vectors uh, is it really heartening. And uh, I will explain just in a moment what we as a College of Surgeons feel we should be doing and supporting in this. My personal journey is I want to share just a little bit about where I come from with this. I'm a plastic surgeon and we live with a life sentence of being misunderstood, I think, because most people think all we do is, is frivolous. Uh, but actually my background came from reconstructive plastic surgery, working in uh, the developing world, and, uh, and when I took up my job 30, over 30 years ago in Oxford, uh, I had been trained in uh, opening up chests, and uh, there was nobody at the time, uh, forgive me my Oxford colleagues, uh, but uh, thoracic surgery was really not on the, on the agenda very much. It was, all, it was a small department and very much cardiac surgical driven. And I took up uh, the, the, uh, single-handedly the, the remit of managing practice conditions, which came to me in, in scores. Uh, and uh, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned today, uh, I'm going, I just want to talk a little bit about prosthetic work as well, but I, uh, I found at the time uh, that there was a, an enormous need for the rabbit procedure, which was the one I, I uh, adopted primarily. Uh, I then had the great privilege, the first time that Donald Moss came over here, he, he came to a, a, a two-day teaching course at Great Ormond Street, uh, that Martin Elliott put on, I think probably before most, <laughs> most other surgeons here started. And uh, I put in a bid for funding for thoracoscopic uh, equipment, which was turned down by the health authority at the time. Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, having done, uh, undertaken a lot of surgery and a lot of patients, uh, and then sometime in the very early 2000s, my uh, entire waiting list of patients with pectus problems was taken away from me uh, by the, the commissioners. Uh, the, the time it was local commissioning, and that was uh, a unilateral decision which I fought at the time and, and failed to uh, get any redress. And I do want to just stress that this is not, you, you, you represent a very, very cogent and, uh, and potent group 
of people with a particular cosmetic problem. What I plead for you to do is to remember that there are other conditions as well for which many people have surgically correctable problems uh, which are not cancer uh, but which are life changing and life transforming. And uh, we've heard from patients today uh, wonderfully expressed, and thank you for your stories, uh, Marfan syndrome, uh, Lewis Deeds, and, uh, and then there are others with Ellis Danos, and we've heard there are many, many conditions that, come to, that have come to me in my career. But uh, I used to use the example, uh, which you've used, Ross, I think, of orthodontics uh, and the, the availability of orthodontics. Actually, my self-specialty interest was always cleft and palate. And uh, there's, uh, I'm, I'm very aware from cleft and palate work that orthodontics is not actually, uh, I, I would plead with us not to sort of put everything on comparative levels and say that's frivolous, because in a way it isn't actually. And I know that, that wasn't what you were you're referring, because uh, if, we, if everybody in my young age, there was a chap called Bernie Winters who was a comedian, and he, made, he had buck teeth and looked terrible. And we've gone to an era when, fortunately, our, community, our society has managed to address that. Where I believe, actually, just as a political point, I think we're going backwards. And uh, we're going to the point again when only the people who have money to afford things uh, will, have, will look proper, they look good. And it's not just about looking good and, and frivolously cosmetically good. It's about quality of life. And so we need to be campaigning for all these things. And that's one of the things that we as a college stand up for. Uh, part of what we, we have a, a huge remit in the College of Surgeons here. Uh, and one of the, one of the, it's basically advancing the best uh, surgical care that we can for the population, not only of this country, but we, have, we want to have a global remit as well. But we do that through maintaining standards, through teaching, training, and, but also through supporting our surgeons and our surgical groups and those who, uh, who, who seek to, to serve you as a, as a community. We also need to get behind subjects such as this. And that's one of the reasons why it's incredibly heartening to have you here in the college today, which is the home of surgery. And it's not just, uh, we, we want to have the whole remit of surgery. This is, this is the, 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 everything within the, sort of the extended surgical team matters to us as well. I don't think we've had a lot mentioned today about clinical psychology, and I work a lot with clinical psychologists. And one of the things that you will be aware, I think, is that uh, just because somebody has a given deformity at a given level, it doesn't mean that you don't suffer as much as anybody else. And we know this from all sorts of, uh, there's oodles and oodles of psychological work that's done on, on such subjects. So we need to include the whole support of mental health and well-being and the psychosocial future of patients with all sorts of conditions. Uh, I did just say I mentioned one thing about uh, um, about prosthetics, and that which I haven't heard mentioned today. And one of the, I, I, in my career of looking after patients with pectus problems, I was aware that quite a lot of patients and, and, and children and, and young adolescents seeking this form of surgery, when they were looking at the, uh, evaluating the problems, if the functional concerns about breathing and all the things we've heard about respiratory, cardiorespiratory effects were the predominant problem, that sometimes they didn't want to take the risk of, uh, albeit very small, but we have heard something about the, the reality of it, that, that surgery always carries with it some consequences. And if they didn't want to take that on, there were some other options. And we, I did quite a lot of custom-made prostheses for patients who, who we were filling the gap with. We did this experimentation with self-setting um, uh, rubber <laughs> solutions and so forth. Again, I had a whole series of moulds which I had to throw in the bin because we couldn't get uh, the implants made in due course when the patients were taken off my waiting list. Uh, but that, that was a way of minimising uh, in, in, in implants. I've actually got something to add to that because yeah. my job is actually a prosthetics fitter. I fit breast prosthetics. Um, and I have to say, I've been doing this job five years. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. I've been doing the job five years. The reason is because I've had to always wear a breast prosthetic because of my pectus excavatum. Um, and so the NHS will fit 
if you um, ask for, to be referred to breast care, if that affects any of you here or any of your female daughters, um, do ask to be referred by your GP for breast prosthetics fitting because I fit them. I have to say I've only had one patient in five years with the same condition as me, but I will fit. <laughs> my hospital can help you find the right hospital if you want to. Thank, thank you for uh, chipping in on that. That's really helpful because uh, the, the, the parts that I was, so there were two sorts I'm talking about. The one I was talking about was a custom made rather yeah. solid silicone uh, implant which can fit the, the, the cavity, concavity usually in the middle. Uh, but the, I did, I had done a lot of uh, use of actually breast implants as well to improve the, the contour uh, more permanently uh, and that, there's, a, there's a role for that. But again, uh, this is a whole, whole subject which we can open up. But, uh, but the main thing I want to say here, I'm sorry to have to, to, to jump in on this and Mary, thank you very much. I, I, I've got a sort of time limit on the end of the day. But I do want to just congratulate you on what you're doing and encourage you along the line. Getting to this stage is absolutely fantastic. And I felt very, very lonely as a surgeon campaigning for this sort of problem in front of funders for, for about the last 20 or 30 years. And I, I'm delighted that you've now got this groundswell of opinion. Let's make a move. Uh, it's, health service funding is difficult. Let's be honest. There are now many patients. It's prou I'm proud to be in a country that can actually spend sometimes £100,000 a year on, the, on biologic treatments for one patient whether they be the queen or the cleaner, uh, because they deserve it for whatever condition they've got. But that pre creates major funding concerns. This is really very cost-effective surgery and, and intervention, so we do need to make sure we defend it. It may cost us a bit more white taxation, who knows, those are the big political arguments. But let's, that's not what we're here for today. I think you made a very good point that, uh, that this, is, this is something we should be campaigning for. So thank you for, for being here and for your Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, for your personal support and also that of the Royal College of England and also for, for with the Vice President from Edinburgh as well. So just thank you for all the organisations that support us. Um, we heard about some of the challenges that exist about getting uh, treatment done in England. We are real privileged to be joined by some of our colleagues from Wales and Scotland to explain to us how and what they're doing in their own countries to, to get an understanding of what we are trying to achieve in, um, in England. So first we've got Margaret Cornus-Huska um, who will talk to us about the, the service they deliver in Wales and then followed by Carl Davis from, from the service in Scotland. I joined, I joined ECARD Unit in 2009. At this time, we were funded, and it was a part of our uh, normal procedure to do an open uh, pectoral surgery. However, we wanted to uh, bring the best option of treatment, minimal invasive treatment. And this why, in 2010, we invited, invited a, a famous uh, surgeon, Professor Will from Strasbourg, to do two first uh, NAS uh, procedure in Cardiff. We didn't uh, stop in this. We organized the Cardiff Pectus Master Classes. And you can see that we are very privileged to uh, have the presence of Professor Nass himself <coughs> in Cardiff, uh, Professor Piligard, Ian Hunt, I don't know, yes. <laughs> And this meeting was very well attended. It was organized for all UK. We are hoping that we can spread, spread the knowledge how to uh, do a pectus surgery and how important is a pectus surgery for our young people. The next, uh, uh, let's say, seminar we organized, we're not in the pectus only, pectus excavatum, we were thinking about pectus carinatum. And at this time, we have uh, Professor Mustafa Yoksel and the surge that we, we wanted to learn how to do a pectus carinatum surgical option and bracing. And this time is one, <coughs> one of our first case of a Branson correction of pectus uh, carinatum. We started to do a, a bracing. Initially we used an expensive dynamic brace. Now we have a choice of different, more uh, uh, affordable brace. Unfortunately, we can provide the surgery on the NHS uh, in Wales, 
but we still, despite uh, submitting a business case in 2015, <coughs> resubmitting it every year, we, we have no funding for any brace or parking belt. The patient need to self-fund, however, we allow to uh, follow this patient on uh, outpatient, but we are not able to fund them. We can still operate on them, but we, we can't brace them. And this is the number of, we, of cases we did in practice still today. You can see the start was not easy. There was quite a limited number of cases and it was always a fight between pressure of cancer and the more urgent cases in practice. And it's only in about 2015-16 that our waiting list became so big that management started to have a concern. There was a lot of complaint. We need to do something about this waiting list. And we did agree that we will have one protected day in a month to do a search. Otherwise, we were not able to access the theater. So till now, we did 133 cases of back to surgery. We still have a 37 patient on accepted already waiting list for surgery. We still have 22 presently waiting to be seen our patient, and presently we have 30 patients bracing under bracing under our supervision. Uh, we usually do a patient do a patient above 16. Most of our patients are male, and the heart index was more than four. And I think what is important on the echocardiogram was more of that 50% of our patients had a sign of, of right ventricular compression. And I think we did have a lot of argument, and I think there is no doubt that this patient had a physiological, major physiological impact, and you can document it on the lung function, on the cardiac ultrasound, but as well a very strong, important psychological impact. How we still able to do a, a pectus surgery? It's always difficult to introduce a new procedure. The procedure which exists is more, more easier in Wales to maintain. We have a different commissioning system in Wales at UK. So we commission, as this is our this year a number of cases, we are commissioners. We are commissioners in bulk for a which about 600 cases, which is split by, between major complex and intermediate case. Uh, so our activity, as long as there is no major hiccup, major complication, most probably it's not so heavily scrutinized as it's it in England. I was trying to discuss this slide about the uh, remuneration for our procedure. It's ex uh, marginal rate. I was discussing with the finance as they were not able really to explain what is it for. And uh, we, we, we assume that this is most probably the price for consumable, but the hospitalization, medical staff are completely funded <coughs> from different, uh, let's say, the budget. I have a patient which I wanted maybe hear a statement. I think we had a very emotional statement. Because whenever she'd pick something out for me to wear, it would always it would either be too tight or it'd be they'd be low cut and you could see the start of it and it would always really end in arguments because my mum would say you can't see it but I'd feel like you can. And so I'd just stuff the wearing baggy tops and I was always really like uncomfortable. After the surgery I'll I'll be able to go swimming. I can wear nicer tops if I wanted to. Like thinking about prom, I wouldn't have to worry about wearing a dress that I stayed up there. If I wanted to wear like a, a dress that has no sleeves or something, I could wear it and not have to worry about seeing my chest. I'll be able to breathe better. I won't have to worry about getting out of breath so quickly. And and I'd just be a bit more confident and I could wear whatever clothes I wanted and not have to worry about if people can see it because it wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. 
I have another statement. I don't know if we can we load our, our load. If, if we have a time for another statement, are we, are we sure? Oh, okay, no, no, it's fine. So I think the, there is no doubt that it's a pleasure to see a smile on these young people's faces, and that the pectus surgery is a life changer for this group of patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Similarly, from Scotland, we have um, the Honour of uh, Carl Davis joining us and Ashley Johnson are going to give us a, an idea of the service they offer up there. So, um, we have a nationally funded Scot um, chest wall service in Scotland and it was commissioned from the 1st of October 2016 following a bid to the National Services Division of NHS Scotland. So, that's just the, 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 the way through. Um, it's based at the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow, so therefore it deals with children and adolescents up to the 16th and at the push 18th birthday. Anything beyond that, uh, we're not eligible to treat. Um, we have annual reviews and we, we publish reports. The reports are all on our website, which we'll show you at the end, so if anybody wants to read them, they can. Um, so it's public to me. The principle of the service is that we provide a comprehensive service that offers non-surgical treatments as well as surgical treatments to minimize the overall uh, need for people to undergo surgery. So you can imagine when I got this commission, my selling point was if we provide a comprehensive service, I will not be doing as many operations as me as a surgeon, trying to get myself out of the job. So, um, and, and the conservative ones are dynamic bracing for pectus carnatum and the vacuum device for pectus excavatum. Now, we did initially provide the, the vacuum for pectus excavatum because um, there were about, there were about 500 euros at the time, and I felt if I gave them away, and I would never have a handle on how much they were being used, and that's a lot of money, a really good excuse for. Um, them not to commission the service, so we initially didn't do that, but actually managed to persuade them subsequently to, to provide that. So we run a, a chest wall clinic in, in, on a Wednesday morning where one or two uh, pediatric surgeons are present. I'm, I'm pretty well always there, and sometimes I'm, all, I'm there on my own, but usually there's two of us. We have the specialist uh, physiotherapist, Ashley and her colleagues, and we have one or two senior orthosis as well. And we make a lot of use of medical illustration. We do 3D imaging of chest. And the Wednesday afternoon, the physios run their clinics and orthotics run theirs as well. So here's the epidemiology and sort of the population that we're using since October 16 to the end of September um, 22. So that's six years of the service being nationalized. We have seen almost exactly 1,000 patients, new patients, being referred into us. And here's the breakdown. So you can see here, um, all comers is just over 50% have got pectus carnatum, um, 36 and a bit percent have got pectus excavatum. There's 5.8% uh, to add to that who have a, a mixture. We talk about a complex or a mixed picture that you heard earlier from Ian. Um, and there's um, a little known condition called pectus arcuatum that we've seen the odd one. And obviously we will have had a few other referrals and other things as well. And the demographics are that 85% of our population are male. We heard about scoliosis earlier. And 6.6% of our people um, in the, who come to the clinic have that. Interestingly, twice as common in excavatum than it is in carnage. Pretty well. Family history in 14%, we talked about that earlier. Interestingly, again, twice as high in excavatum than it is in carbonatum, 20 versus 10. Marfan syndrome, we confirmed in about 0.9%. I'm pretty sure we underestimate that it'll be higher. And the average BMI of those coming to our clinic is 17.2. So this is the picture pre and post of referrals to the service. So obviously referrals into pediatric surgery originally, and then when it became a national service in October 16, you could see the numbers went up. They obviously dropped in 2020 because of COVID, and you can see now that last year, uh, the calendar year, we had 299 new referrals to the service, which is quite a significant number. Um, so, Scotland has 5.5 million people. 
It's 10% of the English population, so you can easily do the maths yourself, and 8% of the whole UK population. So it's equivalent to about 3,000 referrals a year in England. That's maths, that's not editorialising. That's just maths. Um, it doesn't mean 300 is what we're going to plateau at, but it's a reasonable number to work off. So um, I did a little maths, which I know doesn't stand up to scrutiny, so please, if there's a statistician in the audience, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> so we have about 60,000 kids for each age group in Scotland. So 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, they're all about 60,000. Some of them are little ages, a little under, some a little over. So that gives us 304,000 kids in those five years. That's 60,000 per year. If all the children who were referred were in that age group, that would be fine. But actually, again, I went through our database. 70% of our new referrals are within that age group. 25% are younger and just 5% are older. So 70% of 300 is 210, and you work out at about a 1 in the 1400 um, incidents. But of course, boys are 85%. So the maths doesn't fully stand up, but it gives you some idea. Here's a breakdown of the severity, and to, to, to just summarize these two graphs, essentially, us eyeballing and categorizing severity, by and large, excavatum, we would categorize as shifting towards the more severe than carinatum shifting towards the less severe of the whole group. Obviously, individuals would be different. And interestingly, in, in regard to uh, laterality, which means is it symmetrical or is it one or other side, um, excavatum, 84% of excavatums were symmetrical or nearly symmetrical, whereas that was only 34% in carinatum, so a very typical carinatum would be quite asymmetrical. And in fact, there's a two to one right to left for actually both groups if they're asymmetrical. So that's just working off our data. This um, is very Scottish, it's, it's by Health Board, um, and you can see sitting over those six years, those thousand patients, you can see by far and away Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which is a very big Health Board, um, covering right down the, the Clyde, down towards the, the coast. Um, it overall had 41% of all the um, referrals. And obviously Scottish Government want us to be very egalitarian, so we had to do a lot of work to go out there and see could we get the message out, so quite the opposite to England, if I could say that. And we were out looking for patients rather than the other way around. And over the piece, the first six months, you can see here 53% of our referrals were from the greater Glasgow region, whereas in the last six months it was just 31%. And that's there. And moving across Lothian is essentially Edinburgh. No referral, no percentage referrals, uh, from zero percentage referrals from there in the first six months. And we, we've got the message out through Zoom meetings, at, at medical meetings and such like. Um, this is our workup, uh, clinical assessment and taking history and all that. We get 3D photos, we do uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test, which we refer to as a CPAP, you'll hear it hurt refer to as other things in other places, and we measure things like the Haller index and such like. Um, uh, the cardiopulmonary exercise test is very good because it's the only investigation we do when the kids are being exercised. Everything else is you're lying in your back, essentially. So we get a cardiology review, not on everybody. This would be for people who are considering or we are listing for surgery, or they are considering surgery and if the, 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 the young people think that they have a physiological, it might influence their decision whether to go forward for surgery or not. So it helps their decision making. So we will refer them on to cardiology. And we have a specific cardiologist who will, who will assess them. And then they tee up cross-sectional imaging, which initially was CT. It's not very helpful, it just gives us a good look. But we now use cardiac MRI uh, more than before. And importantly, if they are being listed for surgery, we have a thing which actually is set up called chest wall scoop, which means we will have um, a group which used to be in the room but now is on Zoom and such like, 
where you will have all the parents and the kids who are going for surgery in the next block um, meeting um, with the surgeon, the anaesthetist, the physio, the pain team, the nurses from the wards, etc., etc. And very importantly, someone who's been through it already and their parents or parents. So that's really, really helpful. So we lay out for them, this is what's going to happen day one, day two, day three, as best we can. So the kids come in and they know what's going to happen. Uh, and, and that's been a huge bonus from them. And you can thank Ashley for that. Um, I was kind of debating how much or how little surgery I'd show, which I was always going to show very little. And in fact, um, I wouldn't even show this much to the kids the surgeons, we just say this is what we're going to do and we're not going to tell you any more about it than that. This is what it's going to feel like. It's absolutely important to stress how painful this operation is. Um, it, 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 it is often, as something just mentioned earlier, it can be worse than a ravage. The ravage operation, I always say to them, it's, it's like having a car crash, but you were asleep when you had the car crash. Now you've woken up and you're there after the car crash. So everything can, tends to be a bit loose. Whereas this is, is everything is screaming to get back to where it was, which was bent in. So this is us putting a, a telescope in to look at while we put one of these huge big rods across to, to do it. So here is a post-op x-ray of somebody who's already had spinal surgery and a couple of bars in place. We always put in two bars. Now we used to do one for a while. Now we use two for pretty well everybody. Um, it, we see them post-operatively afterwards and uh, Dr. Janosowski is here to have a look at my x-ray to make sure I have lifted it enough. Um, but this we would always do eight pieces of laterals in the end. We don't image any other way um, afterwards. This is, um, uh, we would get MRIs. And some of the x-rays, as you know, many people will have quite severe deformities, but if you do a plain x-ray, it's really not obvious at all on that. It's, it's, it's this cross-sectional imaging. So for um, pectus carinatum and arculatum, we do the ravage operation or modifications thereof. Um, so a quick look through our surgical numbers, pre and post um, starting off the National Service. You can see the blue uh, are the nusses and the, the orange um, are the ravage. And you can see reflecting the fact that we have a very active, dynamic, bracing policy. We have very few kids coming through to um, need surgery for that. that. And that was our selling point and it remains that. And in fact, quite often it's, it's um, arculatum we're doing the ravage for, not, not just, uh, and obviously it's for stiff cases. We have already got 25 kids. We tend to do the, for next year, for this year, I should say, and we tend to do it during the summer months, which is a huge drain on our service because, of course, you can imagine we're trying to pick up post-COVID. It's a massive strain on the service, and I'm trying to get 20-something kids through in, in a, a very short window. Um, and 12, 12 of those didn't get done last year. They've been bumped to this year for all sorts of reasons. So it's, it's always a big job because it's pretty difficult to do the surgery if you're in years where you're doing your exams and you're on strong analgesia and such like you. It's not conducive to studying very well. And I'm going to hand over now to the difficult stuff to Ashley. I'm going to take questions after. Thank you. Um, so it just a matter of what um, Carl's already said, I'm delighted um, to be able to speak to you today as a physiotherapist. Um, um, and um, yeah, to have the opportunity to share the work that um, we've been doing in Scotland. Um, so I came to the post in 2017, and that was in the back of um, our national service designation. So it enabled us to then have a dedicated physiotherapist for the team. Um, my role is split um, in that I have a role with our patients that are going for surgery. Um, so as Carl's already mentioned, we now do a lot of work um, pre-operatively um, in preparation. Um, and we also do a lot of work to encourage an enhanced recovery um, after surgery as well, encouraging um, day zero up moving, day zero mobilisation, um, which has made a huge difference to the outcomes for our patients. My second role um, within the service is to see all the patients that come to our clinic um, and to look at their posture and their breathing pattern. 
So, as a respiratory physiotherapist, I felt I needed to get this in, um, which is about how we breathe. This is really bread and butter um, for us. And when we breathe, um, we breathe in primarily through our nose, um, and our chest needs to expand. So we breathe in, our diaphragm, which is a big muscle that sits underneath our lungs, drops down and our whole chest wall expands. Then as we breathe out, when we exhale, the chest wall then needs to contract. Okay? And that kind of mirrors uh, the movements of the ribcage you can see in the diagram. So the front of our chest moves up and down, which is described like a pump handle. Okay? And the lower chest moves more like a bucket handle. So that's how our chest needs to move as we breathe in and we breathe out. What then happens when we've got a change to the shape of our chest? And this is what struck me back when I started in the clinic, that the way that our chest moves when we've got a change to, to its shape, um, it very much changes and we've got that reduced mobility. Okay? That then places our muscles at a disadvantage and starts to cause a change in posture and a change in breathing pattern. And I'm sure um, a lot of you all uh, relate to the picture in the diagram there of a, what's described as a pectus posture. Now, I was very fortunate back in 2018 to be at a conference, chest wall conference, um, and be able to speak to, to Donald Musk. Um, and I'd, you know, I was saying to him, this is what I see as a respiratory physiotherapist starting to work with children who've got a change in the shape of their chest. You know, I can see a change to the, the movement. So he said, well, you've got to do something about that then. Um, so hence, I started a PhD, um, which um, I'm now three years into. And research is really an important part of our service in Scotland. Um, so as part of my PhD, I am looking at what is the impact of a chest wall change or chest wall deformity on our breathing pattern. So we're just about to start our data collection. And as part of that, we're going to look at how the chest wall moves. So in order to do that, the kit that's in the diagram to the side of my slide there is called Structured Light Plasmography. And essentially what that does, it's a machine that's got a projector and a camera, and the projector shines a grid on the patient's chest. And the camera from that grid can then calculate how the chest wall moves. So we're hoping that we can gather data from all of our patients with both pectus excavatum and pectus carinatum that come to clinic, we can start to gather the data just to learn more about how chest wall movement is affected. Alongside that, we're going to look at lung function, we're going to look at symptoms that are reported, and physical activity levels too. But what can we do about it from a physiotherapy um, perspective? So we do lots of work on um, exercise for posture and to optimise breathing pattern as well. We do some inspiratory muscle training, which is essentially resistance or strength training for um, your breathing muscles. Um, and we can use the vacuum bell for patients with pectus excavatum and bracing for those who've got pectus carinatum. So firstly, I'm going to touch on the vacuum bell. Um, so the benefits of the vacuum bell are obviously, we've touched on this earlier um, today, it's not invasive and it's very easy to use. Um, we have started to look at kind of pathways for using the vacuum bell. We've used it now since 2019 and it's we're kind of learning as we go. Um, and looking at our data so far, what we can identify is that ideally the appropriate age appears to be about 15 and under from what we can see. Um, depth, it makes a big difference as well. And ideally we're looking at a depth of the excavatum to be roughly two and a half centimetres or under. Um, the length of time that the vacuum bell is on makes a huge difference. Um, and we do recommend that our patients start, we build them up to achieve in two hours a day. Okay? Um, we then try, once we've mastered two hours a day and the skin's okay, we, you know, we need to be careful of the skin integrity with the vacuum bell and that you can end up with blistering and bruising. So once we know our patient can achieve two hours, we will encourage them to go over that as they are able. Um, and although we can see results in a, quite a short time frame, the best results we do see is um, between 12 to 18 months. So you are really in it for the long haul. 
In saying that, however, I thought it was useful to put in this slide, who's for, which is a 16-year-old male, so kind of older than what we feel is um, optimal. Um, and he used his vacuum bell daily for two hours, not over two hours. And this is the correction that he achieved in just three months of real dedicated use. So he obviously continued to use the vacuum bell after that point. But if you do use it, it will work. This is the data that we've got for our vacuum bells so far. So we've issued, um, it's just over, I think we're at the 200 um, mark now. At this point I put the slide together, we were at 188. Um, we can see that our, we have a huge range of age, and that's really because it was a new service, so we had to start somewhere. Um, so we have given out vacuum bells um, to 8 to 18 um, year olds, um, with a mean of 13.7. Um, 85% are male, um, and our starting depth is a mean of 2.14, but again you can see there's a huge range in the starting depth from just 0.5 centimetres to 5 centimetres. And we measure that just with a little rod, measuring rod that comes with the vacuum bell devices. Um, then looking at what we can achieve, so that our mean depth following use of the vacuum bell is 0.9 centimetres, uh, with a bit of a range there from 0.5 up to 2.5 centimetres. So although we've got numbers, the numbers are always useful to give us feedback to make sure that we can see whether the vacuum bell works, we also recognise as a service uh, that we need to understand what the real impact is. Um, so we've been using a quality of life score um, with our patients um, since we started using the vacuum belt back in 2019. Um, and the tool that we decided to use was um, the PEDS QL, which is a, a kind of generic quality of life um, assessment tool. Now it's reverse scored, um, so it's scored out of 100. Okay? And this is a snapshot of the quality of life of our, all our patients um, who have taken on a vacuum bell. And if you look at the, the bar chart at the side there, that gives a comparison compared to um, published normal um, values for healthy subjects. So you can see there, our patients in the orange um, compared to the healthy subjects in the blue, and um, that we are seeing a marked reduced quality of life, especially in our total and our physical um, parameters. Looking at um, completion of our vacuum bell, so out of our 188, so far 86 have been are completed. Um, and you can see in the blue in the pie chart there that 45% or 39 of them have been successful so far. So that is probably in line with the literature which suggests that about 50% of those that use a vacuum bell are successful. Now what I do feel is you would look to obviously try and improve that, but we have been learning with the vacuum bell and we feel now that we're kind of becoming more confident um, at identifying when a vacuum bell would be appropriate or not. Looking at our unsuccessful um, patients, there have been 47 of them, 55%. Um, and you can see that in the grey, 24% of them, or 21 of our patients, it was due to compliance. Okay? Um, and I think that we need to be very aware of that it's the, the patient or the child that decides whether or not they want to use the vacuum bell um, and not the parent. Okay? Because it, it does always seem a good idea in clinic, um, and though that would be dead easy two hours a day, but actually it doesn't always pan out that way. Um, we have got in the orange, um, 17 patients or 20% that ended up opting for surgery, and in the yellow, 9 were for another reason, and that would probably be um, that their chests were too stiff for the vacuum belt um, to work, or quite often in our female patients, um, when they start to develop breast tissue, it can become more tricky to fit the vacuum belt. Um, so, um, to move on now to um, brazing um, for our patients with peptis carinatum. Um, in the picture here, this is the brace that we use in Glasgow. Um, it was designed by our orthotics team that run our brazing service. Um, it's um, relatively cheap. Um, we can manufacture this for less than £200. Um, it is very light, um, made of carbon fibre, and you can see it's very low profile as well. It's the big aim is to not make this bulky. 
And it's a two-point four system, so the, the pressure goes from the front of the chest and the back as well to apply that force to the uh, pectus carinatum. And it's very easy to put on and off. The key requirements for our raising is to get the correct tension, uh, which the orthotist will help our patients with. Um, it needs to be worn for 16 to 20 hours a day. Um, and what we do have in our bases is we've got a little temperature um, sensor that's fitted in and from that we can download the data logger to find out how long the patient has been using their back, their, sorry, their brace for. So it is a little bit sneaky, but it possibly helps with um, compliance. Um, and again, it's the very same as the, the vacuum bell. We've got some nice data to show that it needs to be patient driven. This is one of our case studies. This is a 13-year-old male. Um, we classified him as a moderate um, caranatum. Um, he wore his brace for six months and um, for 20 hours per day um, and achieved um, great correction. And we've obviously got many cases um, very similar. Numbers-wise, so in Scotland, we've now provided 557 braces. Um, you can see it in the pie chart there in the, blue, the light blue, 28% um, to 155 um, patients are still ongoing with this. Um, looking at our patients who have completed raising, in the orange, um, that is those that have had full correction um, from using their brace, 188 patients. And then in the grey, that's um, those who have achieved partial um, correction, that's 80 of our patients, or 14%. Um, those have been unsuccessful, um, in the yellow, then 20% of them are due to uh, being lost to follow-up. Um, and in this tiny 4%, there are 25 of our patients with pectus carinatum have undergone surgery. Um, so coming back um, to my research, another part of my PhD is just to try and understand more about what the impact of having a change to your chest tube or chest wall deformity is on quality of life. Um, so um, for one of the chapters of my thesis that I'm writing, um, I completed a systematic literature review to look into quality of life. Um, and the conclusions that we've drawn from that is that there really is a lack of understanding um, of the impact of having a change to the shape of your chest due to um, poor standardised data collection. Everybody's using different ways to look at quality of life um, and measure it at different times as well. Um, the literature that is out there um, so far is very much based around surgery um, and we really need to understand more about um, the impact of having a change to your sh shape of your chest without focusing on intervention. What we can say is that there's definitely improved psychosocial quality of life following um, correction of pectus excavatum, but we're, we're still we're unclear as to what happens for the physical impact or the physical sorry, quality of life. Um, and we, the literature doesn't really help us to understand the difference between having a pectus caranatum to a pectus excavatum or a pectus arcuatum as well. So there's lots of work to be done on understanding more about what the real impact of a change in shape of your chest is. So we have, as I mentioned, been using um, the PEDS quality of life score since September 2019. Um, and how we've tried to approach this is by sending out um, the questionnaire with our appointment letters, which has been a little bit ad hoc. Um, so we've seen over that time, we've seen 686 patients, and we've brought back 280 completed questionnaires. And you can see there how that's split between the presentations. And again, when we look at the data from healthy subjects, we can see that patients who have got chest wall deformity have a lower total and physical quality of life score than the healthy data set. So just to summarise the, the Scottish service, um, our aim is to provide a comprehensive service for all major um, pectus pect pect abnormal abnormalities. Um, we offer non-surgical treatments where it's suitable um, to minimise our overall need for our patients having surgery. And importantly, we're acknowledging both the physical and the psychosocial impact of having a chest wall deformity. So we're, we're going for the right option for the right patient.
and that's just on my tour website. So our colleagues from Wales, Marlborough, Ashley and Carl, if you have any quick questions for them before, in the interest of time, we need to go on. Sorry, everybody else leaves. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a short uh, comment. Um, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I uh, reflect um, it's extraordinary to see what Scotland has achieved by joining up a service and um, putting expertise all in the same place and seeing the research that you can do. And Scotland is the eighth in size of England, and it probably means that we need eight centres in England to match their service. We're already four years behind them. Um, and we'll get on to Joel's guidelines or you know, the, the society's guidelines. But if you think four years ago, before it was decommissioned, uh, we were enthusiastic hobbyists, um, you know, some adult surgeons, some thoracic surgeons, some good physiotherapists, but we weren't joined up in England. And although it's awful that it hasn't been available for four years and people have suffered with their conditions because of that, uh, we actually have an opportunity to put together a really good service in England uh, and let's hope we can work with the NHS and, and get that in place. But uh, Ashley and Carl, um, extraordinary what you've achieved in Scotland, and thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Very quick one. You mentioned paleology review, both uh, ECG and ECHO. Do you have particular protocols or particular technicians who do those? Because my experience of trying to have an echo when it was uh, trans um, it was skin, not, not trans mm -hmm. um, transdermatic, uh, that the ultrasonographer just had no idea. And I was yeah. trying to say to her, no, no, yeah. my heart's over here. And it, she was it, treating it, me like it, I was it, You make a very good point. Um, it is very technically difficult in excavatum for the ultrasonographers to get the standard views that they're used to of the heart. Uh, in the pectus excavatum, so they do struggle, and it, it's for just technical reasons. Um, we are about to pull a lot of our cardiac MRI data and our echo data and our uh, cardiology assessments together to, to try and analyze them, to try and streamline that, to decide who actually needs. Now, in my hospital, because it's called a cardiac MRI, it's only cardiac doctors who are allowed to order it, and they've got a lot of congenital heart disease. I know, I know. But I, because I was allowed to go through this system, and essentially every time we send somebody, they go in for a cardiac MRI, I didn't lose any sleep over it. If they weren't getting what I wanted, I would have lost sleep over it, and I would have done something about it. So I was happy to let it go through that circuitous route. And, and, but now, my cardiologist sort of said to me, um, oh, we, we just look at the patients and we can work out, you know, which is what I was doing anyway. So, so um, it, it's, 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 it's probably unnecessary if you do um, a cardiac MRI. But we have picked up a lot of uh, conditions that wouldn't have been expected, like non-compaction and stuff like that. So we've picked up some incidental important things as well. Um, and we've got lots of numbers because the cardiac MRI looks at um, ejection fraction, volumes, and stuff like that. So we're in the process of trying to analyze those to see, um, you know, can we make some sense of it? And you know, just because you get a reading of a measurement that an MRI scan can do doesn't mean it makes any sense or it's of any relevance. So we're trying to work that out at the moment. And yeah, I and of course we also get patients who have a lot of symptoms and. You know, we've got the album with heart block and stuff like that that have been picked up, and that's actually the explanation for their symptoms rather than the pectus. So, so there's still a role for moving through that system, but but it's technically difficult. And do you ECG? Do you put the links in the normal places? Because all mm, my ECGs well, I don't do it, like so I have no idea. But yeah, but it's soon, so yeah, theorized. Mine all look like I'm in asystole. You know, I've got my voltage criteria so tiny. Well, we we I mean, we've got a congenital heart disease program, cardiac surgery and everything, so you, you've got very high skilled technicians. We never use TOs for anything you ever need. Thank you. So you've heard about the, the system, the, the service they have in Scotland and Wales, and 
now I'm very grateful for a member of the NHS England to come and talk to us today. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you again, Ashley and Carl. It was a really great talk to see how a great national service can be set up and run. And also, Margaret, thank you for telling us what's happening in Wales and how you've succeeded in carrying on. <coughs> right. The, the fact of the matter is, Pectus care in England is a mess. And it was a mess before it was decommissioned. And there were islands of excellence that have been able to carry on over the last few years, particularly through the COVID period. And you've heard from some of those people today, Joel, Ian, uh, Sham, and others. But it is very, very patchy, and it is clear that signposting is not available. It is, it is, Pectus is not a rare condition, but it's definitely not a common condition, and most GPs will see very few cases in their career. So we need to address this, and you will hear shortly from Joel, who will describe the development of the joint practice guidelines looking at Pectus. I have a number of roles. I am part of SCTS, the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery, and currently chair of the Thoracic Surgery Committee. But at the end of last year, I was also appointed as the NHS England National Thoracic Surgery. So don't shoot me yet, because I haven't really had a chance. But one of the first things I did at the end of last year was to ask for this meeting and also to start working with my colleagues in the NHS to move this forward as quickly as we can do. And it's, it will be a stepwise approach, and I'm delighted that Fiona Marley has been able to come along today, who's Head of Specialised Commissioning, to tell us the next steps. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I think you've promoted me. I'm, I'm only at the highly specialised bit of um, uh, the service. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. I've only very recently come in to this clinical area and actually sitting here this afternoon and hearing people's stories and hearing all the information you know, that's been really valuable to me. Um, I work very closely with patients and patient groups with all the services I'm involved in um, because, you know, as someone who doesn't have a, a pectus um, issue, I need to understand what are the things that are really, really important to people. So it's been a really valuable experience. Um, the reason that I've been brought into this service is that in my day job in NHS England, I make services available to patients who have rare conditions and who need really expert care. So um, in my job, I commission about 80 services for patients who have rare conditions or who need really complex care. So that's why I've been brought in to take this forward. Um, a bit of background, and I know some of you know this already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, to, on it. I'm going to get on to the more interesting bit because um, Mr. Kuhn and I want to share what we think the patient pathway is going to look like. I think that's going to be much more of interest to you than some of this background. <coughs> um, so at the moment, we've said that we don't think as NHS England that there's evidence for surgery to make it routinely available. But we are very aware, we've heard you know, some really compelling information this afternoon about the fact that some patients have very severe cardiac breathing problems. Um, and um, as Mr Kuna has said, this is a, this is a stepwise um, uh, pathway to take forward, you know, to develop a proper service. Um, and in parallel, you'll also be aware that we're working with NIHR to look at further research for pectus surgery. Um, NHS England always looks at what's the evidence base, and what is published evidence, and that's how it takes services forward for patients. So what we are going to be um, publishing is what we call an urgent policy statement. Um, and the word urgent is important in there because we know there's a lot of patients on NHS waiting lists at the moment, some formally, and some, I guess, more informal waiting lists where clinicians are aware that people have um, severe physiological symptoms. So this is going to go on our website, and I will make sure whatever the appropriate route is that people get to know where that link is once that's been published. 
And you can see here that the inclusion criteria are PE, um, with a number of those various areas there. So, you know, real um, severity issues there. And at the moment, patients with um, PC are excluded. But this is going to be on the policy statement, which will go onto our website. Um, so what are we doing? I'm going to show the patient pathway in a minute. It will be really interesting to see what people's comments are. Um, but what we want to do here is where we can take advantage of any virtual technology. We don't want patients have to be travelling for surgery if they really don't need to. We want to, you know, the local clinicians are the people who know all these patients. So where there can be local decision making to identify potential eligible patients. I've heard very loudly this afternoon about you know what can we do before even patients get to need surgery. So we are going to need to identify some more local services, um, and we want to have that shared care between the local centre and any national centre. What we plan to do is to rapidly identify at least one centre nationally who could run a, a multidisciplinary team and offer surgery to eligible patients and a second centre in due course. You know, we'll need to, as you might expect, they need to have experience of undertaking surgery. But we've also heard about the fact that the multidisciplinary team is really important here. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see that it's actually a real range of people. It's the surgeon, it's the cardiologist, there's the psychologist. Um, and, you know, if the um, referring consultant wants to be part of that MDT, they can. And of course, because we can do things virtually now, doesn't mean that people all have to be sitting in the same room. People can come from across the country. Um, can people see that? Is it too small? Is it a bit small? I'll try and read that. So this is, this is the sort of draft patient pathway, which I'll be really happy to take some views on. And, um, Mr. Kuhn and I have been working on this together. Um, so, um, first of all, you've got a patient who's on the waiting list in the local surgery centre. Um, we, we want to put some responsibility onto that local centre. So, for example, it's for them to say whether or not they think those individuals are going to meet those eligibility criteria or not. And they're the ones who know those patients much better than anyone else. And we think we really need to prioritise um, pre syncope or syncope um, for those patients to get to that national multidisciplinary team first. Um, if someone's identified as possibly eligible, then there's imaging, functional tests, and we're going to ask the individual who's got the pectus deformity to, have some, to send some photographic evidence into the MDT. If they're not eligible for treatment, they go back to their local centre, and it may be that they're eligible for the NIHR study. Um, if I move down to the bottom of the slide, patient's going to be considered by the MDT. I've got a sidebar there, which is about genetic referral, spinal referral, non-surgical prevention. I've, I've put that there, but in fact, from what I've heard this afternoon, that could come at any point in the pathway and possibly earlier on. And again, if the MDT decides the patient's not eligible, um, I'll go on to the next slide. You can see that they might they be referred back and might be eligible for the study. Um, if the patient's eligible, we would, would then have a virtual consultation with the patient so they don't have to travel to the surgical centre at that stage. And if their local clinician wants to be there, again, that can be virtual. And then the patient obviously does have to have a pre admission check and surgery at the National Centre. There's then immediate post-op review, which will probably be face-to-face, -face, again with the local clinician, further follow-up locally, and then possibly surgical removal of the bars at a later stage. So that's all I was going to present. Um, Mr. Kinnan, have you got anything you want to add? Um, uh, what's also very important, as you've heard from Scotland, is the number of patients who will need non-surgical treatment uh, and that will be built into this pathway. Th this is a pathway to get surgery up and running as soon as possible, as well as possible. We recognise that people would like to have more specialist centres. I am confident that in the future there will be more specialist centres around England. But at the moment, 
In order to get this going as soon as possible, the plan is to start with one centre and then go through a consultation phase for more centres. And I'm sure it will improve in that time. I very much hope that we are weeks away from being able to publish this pathway and get things moving. Thanks to you. Can you questions? Yes. Um, yeah. How much time, do you think that implemented? We're working on it really hard. I mean, we've done this in two or three weeks. From now? From no, we, you yeah, and I yeah. put this together in two or three weeks. So, um, uh, it is, it's weeks, not months. Yeah, so, so what we're going to do is prioritise patients just like your daughter, okay? And they will be put through at a very early stage to the National MDT and we'll ask the surgical centre to prioritise them for treatment. I just want to be very, very clear about this. You know, th this is going to happen. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. I can, I can boom. Okay, Sarah, boom. So my question is, that looks to be a very interesting pathway, and I'm sure we're here from uh, patients and carers and parents, but what you're missing is the bit at the very beginning, which we heard from Lynn, which is access from the GP. Because unless you can get them into that system, and unless you can get the GPs educated to spot it, and to get them into your one centre fits all at the moment, um, my suggestion to you is there'll be a lot of people who are still scrabbling around trying to get access into that pathway. So I think you've missed the pre-step into that system. So can I just say, yeah, I can boom as well. Um, that's not my bit of the NHS. The so so hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I wasn't, I wasn't going to say yeah. that. So, but to, to do that bit, we need to put you in touch with the, the bit of the NHS that covers that GP bit. So well, I suggest you do the link, rather than making us do the link, you do the link with the GPs, because that is really, really important for these people in this room. The only thing I can say is that your story is going to be not much more compelling to that bit of NHS England than mine is. Because you are if you NHS me, England. If you want me to focus on getting this into place, I can certainly make some contacts, but you're, you're going to be much more compelling than I am about describing that, that need. Yes. Um. Sorry, I'll, I'll, let me just I'll, I'll also answer it, Sarah. I, I, I think the point you raise is very valid, and I think we will have very strong signposting um, as a professional society, and we will have signposting. Um, you've heard about the importance of social media in this. It will, there will be signposting through that route, um, and uh, we will grow that signposting. Uh, through uh, educational workshops, um, through th the thoracic surgery centres, um, it will propagate. And I, I just, at this point, I need to also share with you, last year, we did something very similar for a different condition called lung volume reduction. And we went from extremely patchy services throughout not only England, but Great Britain and Ireland, to every centre, every thoracic surgery centre in Great Britain and Ireland having a lung volume reduction service. Okay? So it, it, it can happen, and I think it will happen. Um, Carl, you had a question, sorry. Can yeah, I? Yeah, I, I guess I might ask questions, which is the same as commented. Um, I think you, you've got a pent up need I, I just worry about one centre whether it could possibly cope with the numbers. Uh, in the, you know, for the foreseeable future. We don't think it will, but we need to get it going. And we don't want to hold, to have identified multiple centres. We want to get this up and running. Very lovely. Thank you. Please, yeah. Look, should we just pass it on? Who is in charge, though, within the NHS for this pathway referral that GPs see on a screen? Who actually determines what's written there for pectus conditions. Because I have seen, I'm not going to stitch anyone up here, for, for one NHS region, 
in England. I actually shared it with Joel, who was, I think, quite frankly, a bit appalled with the way it had been written. And I said, well, who, who do we go to then, you know, to try and correct this? So it's not as simple as that, because the referral guidelines can be different for every NHS region. It's, it's complex, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, um, I don't want to preempt anything that Joel is about to tell us. Um, he, uh, in particular, but also uh, many other colleagues and specialist societies have been producing joint practice guidelines. We call them joint because they're multi-specialty. These will lay out the standards for the care of practice patients and it's a detailed document. We will make a Society for Cardiothoracic Surgeons pathway, which might be a joint specialty pathway, which is much simpler. And we will then submit that to the different commissioning bodies, including NHS England, and ask them to take it into consideration. So I will now step, take one step aside. I'm the National Clinical Lead for Thoracic Surgery, so it's quite likely that approval, from my perspective, would be immediate. Uh, it will then go through specialised commissioning and then appear on the, through the NHS. And, and I, I just want to emphasise, of, of everything that I am doing currently, this comes top priority as far as working within the NHS. or maybe a child is struggling to breathe, or they've maybe got a heart condition. The GPs were stuck at that very first point of where to go. So rather than reinventing the wheel, why don't you just send that to every GP and say, if you've got a patient with pectus, this is what you need to follow. And that way we know what gets into the GP surgery. After that, it's negligence they don't know about it, in other words, for them to go looking for it. But at least we're setting something in front of them that says, pectus is a problem, these are the age bands, and this is the pathway referral if it comes to you. That's my first point. My second point is, do you and will you take extra contracts or referrals from other parts of the UK? Which is something I understand is available in the NHS if that part of the UK cannot offer the service. So, I'll answer your second one first. So, this, this would be a national service for the whole of England. It's not, a, it's not a regionalised service. Obviously, we've heard from Scotland and Wales that they have their own services. I know you're from Northern Ireland, so, and we work very closely on these really specialist services with Northern Ireland. They quite often access our services. Well, so we don't have one at the moment, and we don't, uh, certainly in our case, we weren't aware at all, and neither was anyone, that we could have potentially had an ECR. So what I'm saying is, can this include where possible until a service is set up there or in any other region that can be accessed? Can this include a reference to extra contractual referrals where a service is not available within that region of the UK? So theoretically, absolutely yes, because that's what we do with lots of services for patients from Northern Ireland. There's lots of English patients waiting as well, so I'm just going to catch that onto um, a little bit. I mean, I'm sure there's a number of routes to GP surgery. Yeah, uh, again, I don't want to jump ahead of Joel, but clearly the Royal College of General Practitioners, who is the equivalent to the Royal College of Surgeons, would have an interest in this. So that's another route that we will go through. Yeah, the aim is to, is to propagate it far and wide and fast. Whichever single centre you choose isn't going to be able to see all the patients that are waiting. Uh, so, for example, all my patients are in London. If you choose a centre north of London, 
Do they go there, travel there to be assessed, or is the assessment remote, and then they're referred back to a local surgeon? Yeah, so, uh, Anne, the, um, the, 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 the pathway will be built around local assessment, virtual assessment as far as possible, and then surgery in the in initially the, 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 the one centre. But as, I, as I've also mentioned, the, the plan would be to expand as required, you know, subject to making it as good as possible. Um, and also, the idea is that it would be a hub and spoke type of model, so should the referring surgeon wish to come down and, or up and work with the specialist centre, they, they could also do that so that they have familiarity with the details of the operation so that local management could be as good as possible. It won't be compulsory, that bit of it, but we want to make it as flexible and easy for patients as possible. Yeah, and you're right, one centre can't do it all. But to get going, we need to get going. We got to choose which surgeon did, if we actually got as far as surgery, which surgeon did it? Or were you only out with one surgeon in your centre? So, so uh, that, the, the standard is that if there's a choice of surgeons, if there is a choice of surgeons, then you have a choice of surgeons. So, you know, there's, that, that, that's for anything. Uh, it, you know, that where, where patients can have a choice, they have a choice. Right, so if you so, be a local surgeon, it would be the surgeon that you use at your... You said you're going to have a specialist centre. So how many surgeons would you have at your specialist centre? The, 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 we're not quite at that point, but uh, to, to be a specialist centre, you'll need to have more than one surgeon doing the, the procedure, because you can't have a service a service with just one surgeon is extremely vulnerable and unstable, so we don't want that. We want this to go forward. But thank you. Joel. Just, uh, just first of all, I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming, Fiona. Uh, that's been some of the most positive things I've heard in four years uh, from NHS England. Thank you. <laughs> We're very much aware that uh, you know it might not be feel like a friendly room uh, to somebody like yourself, so it really is most appreciated. And I think this is a really big step forward. Um, there was some talk about a limit of numbers, but would you be able to confirm that if the NDD confirms that they're eligible, we would be able to offer surgery and there wouldn't be a number limit for these patients? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've heard, I think Carl's gone now, but I think what we what we heard from Scotland was that you know the numbers going on to surgery are are relatively small. So we don't ever expect this to be an enormous service. You know, we need to, uh, and I've heard very strong views this afternoon about early intervention, which I will take back. Yeah, so just to answer that very specifically, there's no cap, but there are criteria, and that's what we'll start off with. And that, as you've seen in, in Scotland, um, uh, a greater number are done, but it's still not huge numbers. The majority of people are having non-surgical treatment. And, and you're quite right, again, I'll emphasise this, the pathways to that were not clear, and we need to make that a lot better as well. Hi, yeah. Um, I, I, I just feel a little bit perplexed. Um, can I just confirm that you're saying if our children or anybody meets the criteria on the list, they will get the surgery o on the pathway. Sorry, if our, if our child meets the criteria on the pathway, then they will get the surgery that they need. Yeah, unless the, unless there's some reason. I mean, unless, unless they choose a, not to. Yeah, unless there's a medical unless there's a medical reason. Really, really, or, or, or other reason. Not the reason not to do it. Yeah, yeah. Th yeah. Th yeah. Th yeah. Th yeah. yeah. Th yeah. Th yeah. Th they will. Yeah, just, just, just as a bit of caution, this is quite a quite oh. restrictive uh, set of criteria. Oh, yes, no, 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 Severe no, 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 no. shortness of breath alone is not enough. You will have to also be collapsing, fainting, have dysphagia, or have a life threatening arrhythmia. So, you know, that's, it is a very, very strict criteria, but yeah. it's, a, it's a beginning, no, as no, Anna says, which we're very grateful for. Yeah, yeah, so once again, I've just got to emphasise this. 
And, and, and then Joel said it, this is the beginning. We are identifying that group of people who are suffering the most and get them in, get it started, evaluate, roll out. There isn't a CPEX criteria that you, you have to have severe pectus, you have to have dysrhythmias, uh, you have to have collapse or fainting, or you have to have swallowing problems, or you have to be eligible for scoliosis surgery when the anaesthetist says it would be very dangerous to do the scoliosis surgery. They're the four criteria as laid out. Sean. Hello, and thank you very much for taking so much initiative. I think Joel and we were sort of discussing this so long. And this is the first good news. Yeah. And thank you very much for your poster. And for you, you are right, it's a good book. What I could suggest is make a poster. This is what it comes to you. Please refer it to this center because we have this poster. We have, used to have a, a trans aortic dissection, and they used to die in any without people recognizing it. So we did think aorta poster, and it's there every AE. So if the little uh, junior doctor comes in, and if it goes one, two, three, four, this is what it is, he refers patients to us. This has saved so many lives. GPs. Yeah, GP surgery. You send a poster. You've done a fantastic book. My God, it's amazing. And if you all can do this, I think we could ask some charities to cough off, make a poster, send it to your GP. This, this, this happens. Please do not sit on it. Refer it to appropriate referring center. Sorry, uh, just a very logistical question, if you don't mind. If you've already got a local practice, practice albeit within uh, a non-surgical option, so we have an anxious bracing program at St George's, that continues. Yeah, I forgot there. Yeah, it's the surgery we were talking about. Yeah, so sorry, Ian, I, I didn't get so, it. So if you're already providing a service within the NHS, albeit non-surgical practice options, bracing, for example, that will continue yes. despite the smart. Yes, sorry. That's I, what, I that's just didn't get the non-surgical. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in fact, we, we, we want to signpost to that because, as has been pointed out, people don't know about it. It is it your intention that sorry, the long term thinking, sorry, is it your intention that the long term thinking is that you will mirror the chest wall service in Scotland? Merge. Mirror. 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 Well, I, I think that it, we should learn from excellent practices and it, mirror it, m merge with it, do, yeah. So you will have a funded non-surgical intervention and the, an NHS funded surgical intervention? I think Fiona will admit that the non-surgical treatment is not part of national commissioning. This is a big problem. There are 42 local commissioners and it's not Fiona's remit. Our big problem is how do we get the message out? Our plan is to write the guideline and send it to the commissioners, but I'd be very interested in hearing Fiona's views on how you get the message out to all the local commissioners and whether there's a mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, unfortunately we're going through yet another NHS reorganisation. This is my 13th. Um, so we're now going to have a whole bunch of different commissioning arrangements. And I don't think we know exactly how those are going to operate yet, but you know, I will find my way through them. Yeah. So, Joel, I can perhaps answer that. With LVR, lung volume reduction, this other treatment I spoke about last year, what we did was we produced recommended guidelines and the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery then sent them to every chief executive of a thoracic surgery unit and it was also sent out to all the regional commissioners and it happened. Thank you very much. Um, all due respect to the two people that are still in front of us now, and it's a shame that a lot of the parents have had to leave, obviously for transport and reasons to get home, but I feel the mood has changed dramatically in the last half an hour through the parents, that it seems to be coming across a lot more negative now, and 
government, you're only dealing in facts. But I want to put the fact to you now that our son is waiting with, with John, through John's cooperation, for a CT scan and for the CPAC testing, which we were hoping to have done locally. We're from Somerset, John was obviously middle school. And that's been declined. And I'm only assuming that's been declined because of funding. And this is what I worry about moving forward, is, is funding going to be a major issue for regional centres and for people that, if there's going to be a central hub, I heard the word up and spoke, if there's going to be a central hub, does it reduce the amount of patients that can go through? And, and where is the funding locally? Because where are we going with this scan and the CPAC test now? Do we have to go to Middlesbrough to get that done? And why can't we have it done in Somerset? This is under the existing conditions, not what we're talking about moving forward, but at this first stumbling block, I understand what I mean. So that's my question, is if you have it as a hub and spoke, where's the funding coming from? And why can't we have it now that he can have his test done without having to go to Middlesbrough? So just to reassure you that what we've described today there is national funding for that for wherever you live in england so whether you live in somerset or solly hall or whatever that is funded nationally and if you're someone who meets those eligibility criteria it's not a funding question this is an evidence question i know we're going to hear from joel shortly but this is it's not a you know we're not capping as mr kunar said this is not capping so if you if someone is eligible there is funding available for that patient and it doesn't matter where you are in england moving forward but where we are now with this test with the ct scan and the test we can't have that done locally we've been declined by our local no, health I... authority my understanding the letter we've had to say that we can't have it done in somerset so how do I get it done? Do I go to John in, in Middlesbrough? No, it's not available. No. Yeah. Um, sorry, the, question, the, the discussion we're having is we don't know why it's not available. Uh, the, 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 only, the only way that I can rationalise that at all is that you, you, you've, you've heard that the evidence behind this is a mess. And so people d may not know how to assess it. And Joel is going to present the practice guidelines, sorry, the, the, the evidence, to tell the community, the professional community, how to assess it. So that's the only way that I can rationalise that. I don't under, know why your, your son can't have those tests locally. So uh, you, 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 what you want to know is how do you sort that out? Okay, so. I think that we should just have an offline discussion because I need to understand it a bit better. Is your nearest big hospital Bristol? Uh, yes. Can I just add right. to that? We're Gloucestershire, so we're just down the road, and we had to go to Bristol and we waited seven months for it. Well, for the test? Yeah, we did get it done this week. Right. So we had to get a referral from Cheltenham and Gloucester over to Bristol, wait, and then we got the test. So I think it's because it's not available in Cheltenham, Gloucester, or maybe Somerset, I don't know, but we had to go to a regional centre to get it. But it did take six, seven months. Right. And, and what was your first step? What was your first step? Once you got the letter? So Joel said to my consultant in Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire then said to Bristol, had to then get seen by a Bristol person who then proved it, and then we managed to go to Bristol and get it done. And that was seven months? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Further questions for Anna? Um, I think one thing from our perspective is what, what we're missing here is um, what, what you're proposing to do is treat these are really severe cases. Um, our son's got a, a severe pectus at the pits of our and when all he doesn't have syncope or um, arrhythmias that we know of, he hasn't had any heart testing. But what do you propose to do about those patients? Um, this is still very much a debilitating malformation for our son. It impacts his life, it impacts our life, his brother's life. There's been no mention of that intermediate or the, the more cosmetic cases of how we're going to treat them, what we're going to do for them. Right, I can tell you what we aspire to. 
and we aspire to have treatment for those patients. That's what we aspire to. Now, the, the, the way that I can see this happening is we sort out the mess with the evidence, and you're just about to hear that, and then we go back to NHS England Specialised Commissioning and look at those criteria for treatment, and that includes the group that your son falls into, including the mental impact that you, that you have described. So that's what I would like to see happening in that. In terms of putting the question, it's, it's imminent. When I say imminent, we need to get these practice guidelines out. Uh, we need to get the service up and running. And then to reapproach that question. So uh, that, that's the best answer I can give you. I think to, to follow up on that, I think that's one of the reasons we're here today. There is a complete void in services at the moment. Um, this, what is outlined, is a step. It can only address a small percentage of patients, and you very clearly articulated in the book, very clearly demonstrates the vast number of patients that we need to treat, and we are doing all that we can to make that happen. And, um, I think for me, and I think everyone here, it's powerful hearing everyone's stories to understand the impact that's having and we as a society, National Society, will push the NHS as much as we can and we value your support in, in helping us in that journey. Um, I really apologise about time, we've, um, we've overrun a lot but I think it's important to hear everyone's story so apologies about that. Um, one of the big drivers on how we are going to try and change things moving forward is through our multi-society, um, multi-specialty uh, best practice guidelines. Um, I don't really need to introduce to you all, you all know him as the, the, the hero that he is. Um, Thank you Fiona, um, oh, that's really great. That has fixed all of you in terms of surgery, which you all know him from, but from a personal point of view, he has helped stimulate, progress, and take forward the argument that we need to put to, to national uh, the NHS uh, commissioners. So um, we are really grateful for Fiona and Emma coming here to talk on behalf of NHS England. And we are making a step, but it is a lot more work that needs to be done to articulate. Joel will sort of um, further expand on that and the steps that we're going to take moving forward. So, Joel, <laughs> Well, welcome, my dented friends. <laughs> I'd firstly just like to say how immensely proud I am of our Hectus community. I think it's been amazing. Rachel, you've been phenomenal. Uh, I think, Lynn, that was an incredible book. I mean, that's just amazing what you've done for us. And Shauna coming in that talk. And, uh, and Ellie Musgrave. Those, those wonderful accounts have just been such an amazing, evocative uh, account of what you guys have experienced. Every week I'm in clinic and I meet you guys. Uh, every, I have teenage children and uh, I really feel that you guys, first of all, you have the discovery of this awful condition that your child has and then the horrific problem that you have, you cannot find a solution to it. And so my heart goes out to all of you. I just want to say how grateful I am that you've all come here uh, and uh, I wish you yourselves a round of applause for coming here and being brave enough to come to the Dragon's Den, the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, and also I would love to thank the people that have had surgery already and have come down here. They've come down here purely to share their experience with you, to help our Pectus community. So give yourselves a round of applause. I would like to say a huge thank you to Alan, uh, especially, and uh, Noreen, and Rana, because our society, especially Alan, conceived of this day. Um, I actually was quite sceptical that this would work, and yet it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, the work that you've done, Alan, to get this together, it's brought our community get together, 
And literally, that is the most positive thing I've heard in four years from Fiona, and you made that happen. So I think we should give him a big round of applause. So, uh, you know me as a petter surgeon, uh, but what you don't know is that actually for 22 years I have had a passion for evidence and literature review. Uh, it actually started with six months full time as a systematic reviewer right here in this building. Uh, I used to sit in that corner just there, going through those boxes over there looking for papers to do a systematic review. I've then been a co-author of 18 systematic reviews and I've led the process in seven guidelines. Uh, so when this came out in 2015, uh, I read it and I can honestly say this was the worst performed literature review I've ever read. It was an absolute disgrace. It made a hundred errors, it made typing errors, it made selection errors, it had shortcut reviews, not proper reviews, uh, and it didn't have, it's the only of 18 guidelines that didn't have an expert panel in charge of it. Every single other guideline I've been involved with, you have a panel of experts who know the subject that decide on the subject. This is the one panel that had no experts. They're all cancer surgeons, vascular surgeons, haematologists, nobody who had ever met a pectus patient. That's why it was such a catastrophe. Uh, and this came out in 2015. There were further catastrophes. Um, they were actually trying to bonfire over 200 uh, different uh, clinical conditions of the NHS. They rushed through them very quickly uh, with a company called Turnkey. And uh, not unsurprisingly, there was a raft of judicial reviews uh, that they got hit with. Uh, so they had a load of judicial reviews that were forced to redo the whole system. Uh, and so they got a new company to do it called Solutions for Public Health. I actually have a friend who runs a systematic review company and he would not uh, submit an application to do these because they were paying one third of what it cost him to do a systematic review. Uh, so it was then a rush few. And look, this new committee didn't have time uh, to do a good review, so they put six papers in it, they, they dropped it down. Um, the inclusion criteria were laughable, it was only the last 10 years, not the full body of evidence, it was only 50 patients, it was just horrific. And they tried to take off loads of other things from commissioning. So as was mentioned earlier, robotic surgery, you walk past a robot today, um, robotic surgery is not commissioned in England, from NHS England, for lung cancer, bladder, esophagus, gastric and throat. Um, this is me last week doing robotic surgery. It's decommissioned. Why is pectus not being uh, done and robotic surgery is? In 2019, we all got a letter from NHS England saying you must stop pectus on the 1st of February. Uh, we didn't get that letter for robotic surgery. What is going on? It's a complete mess. Um, here's what else they rejected. They rejected the NICE guidelines. NICE did a very good job of a systematic review saying that pectus was safe and should be done in expert centres. They ignored it. We actually put in, uh, I, I led the SCTS uh, submission of the stakeholders to say, look at all the papers you've missed. You've missed out subgroups of particular harm. They rejected all that. The most incredible thing is they didn't look for patients with squashed hearts. They only looked for psychological changes. They rejected the papers for people with cardiovascular changes. This is the literature review. They, they ignored it and they threw it out. So they only had six papers. They were all single centre surgeons uh, and it was only quality of life and they threw it out. I could go through every single paper they missed, but there was a UK National Registry. They didn't look at it. Our own patients having surgery. Um, an amazing paper by Hans Pieliger I got rejected because it had 49 patients in it. Their criteria was 50 patients. So it was rejected. It's the second best paper that's ever been written in this subject. Um, rejected because it was only on hearts being squashed. Rejected. Dawn Jaralewski's amazing work. Rejected. Rejected. A, a meta-analysis of all the 23 studies. Rejected. Uh, David Sigalet from France. Rejected. Out of the time frame. Or a single clinical site. When actually they included four that were single clinicians. Uh, so incorrectly rejected. And that at the bottom there was directly taken from the NH in England, reason for rejection. Um, it was an absolute catalogue of mistakes. They rejected every single cardiac MRI study. Any study you see in the literature show you've got a squat heart on a cardiac MRI they didn't read. Uh, and the list goes on. The case reports they rejected, the most severest cases in the country, they said, we don't want to look at that because there's, there's only one person. That's not important. So they rejected those. Reject, reject, reject. Every single one. So we were delighted that um, 
that uh, Stephen Clark took our case up and, and opened up uh, a recommissioning process, which was absolutely fantastic. He led a Westminster Hall debate, got the, got the thing reopened, and, and it was all based on, on a wonderful patient of mine, Morton Bradley. This was a normal chest CT, as you all know, and this was her chest CT. Um, he understood uh, the importance uh, of this to her and to many others. So we redid the process. We went to Solutions for Public Health, that group that did the shortcut reviews. Uh, we specifically asked them to do cardiovascular and psychological, and also redos for surgery that didn't work. Amazingly, they came back saying, we couldn't find a single paper on psychological benefit. Remember last time they said they couldn't find a single paper on cardiovascular benefit. Uh, I mean, it was just, incredible. We specifically got them to, to see John Dralewski's paper uh, and, and they rejected it. 140 patients all having surgery showing a cardiopulmonary exercise test improvement. Uh, so this is where we got stuck. But what are we going to do about it? This is what I'd like to talk to you about because uh, we've already taken huge strides today but what are we going to do about it? We're going to do two major things. Uh, the first thing is we have got together a best practice guideline, and I'll go through that for the next 10 minutes. And the second thing is we did persuade them to put out an NIHR call for a study. Now the study is just in severe pectus excavator uh, and it's to improve physical health. There's nothing on psychological health in it at all. We're going to sneak that in. Uh, but, but that is what they have said. They said we will fund it, probably cost two to three million pounds, and we'll fund it. So now I'm going to talk about the best practice guidelines because we want to lay out what we think is best. Frankly, it's the Glasgow service. Uh, I mean, I think Carl and his crew need a, I mean, a round of applause really for their incredible <laughs> service. Um, they are the beacon in Texas uh, that we all aspire to. It really is phenomenal. I do encourage you to look at their document of their service online. It's phenomenal. It really is what we all to aspire to. Uh, but Alan and Lorraine have got together, these societies and more, to agree that this is what our best practice guidelines are going to be. Uh, and we have looked holistically, we've looked at everything. We've looked at supportive care, psychological support, non-surgical techniques, bracing, vacuum belt. We're looking at carinatum as well as excavatum and mixed. Remember, the funding call for the study is only in excavatum. We're going to look at surgical techniques, psychological benefits, uh, and, uh, and, and best practice guidelines and audits. So we're going to do everything, and we're going to do it properly, and we've done it comprehensively. So I'll take you through just a few things in it, because I'm not going to bore you to, to hell about it, although I could pretty much talk till midnight about this. Uh, a few of you would stay, but some won't. Uh, so I found nine papers in 498 patients that have a CPEX before an US procedural ravage and a CPEX afterwards, and they get better. So it's fact, it's in the literature, there it is. So our best practice recommendation, barn door, if you have a CPEX impairment, a severe hyper index, you just should have surgery because it makes you better. The reason NHN is England still reject this is because we have not proven that an improvement in this very accurate exercise test translates to benefit in your life. Now, a bit of a minutiae, but uh, that's what our study needs to prove. We need to prove that your life gets better with surgery. I mean, we will do that a uh, hundred times over, but uh, that's what they have tasked us with proving. We also want to put in our guideline that there's a lower level of evidence, but there are people with relatively normal C pectus, but very severe pectus, that still get an improvement in their cardiovascular ability. So we would like that opened up to the ability to have surgery. So this is what you were saying. This is what a person should have if we worry that they're short of breath because of their pectus. We think they should have a CT or MRI to measure the Haller index. We think they must have an echo. Uh, and that's also to exclude Marfans because 1% of these people will have Marfans uh, and can only be seen on an echo or horizontal imaging. You must have spirometry, you must have a CPEX, uh, and certain centres will offer cardiac MRI. This is what you were saying. This is what the GPs need to see. We need to see this at the start of the pathway. When you go to see a GP that says, I'm worried that in my chest might be making me short of breath, he needs to get that piece of paper out or that online bit of document and say, all oh, right, here's, here are the guidelines. The guidelines say I need these tests. Let's get them done. And it is misunderstanding that's stopping you getting the test in sunset, not any law. There's no rule that says they can't test your child. It's a misunderstanding. When NHS England stopped the surgery, people misinterpreted as saying we've stopped everything. 
and it's a misunderstanding. The guidelines, I hope, will fix that. Um, psychological impairment is, I think, as important as physical impairment, and I think we all agree with that. Uh, and so we need to see a psychologist. Why would you come and see a lunking plumber like me to talk about psychology? You must see a psychologist. I have a wonderful psychologist called Judy Redfern on our service. Some of you have talked to her. She, she elucidates things that I could never get out of a, of a mute 15 year old. Uh, she tells me how much it impacts their life. You know, she costs 50 quid for an hour. Surely we can spare 50 quid for an hour for our children to see if they are severely psychologically impaired. And the number one feedback I get is parents go, oh my God, I didn't know it, my, my kid was suffering that much from 50 quid from Judy Redfern. I would like that to be uh, for everybody. Um, we need to assess it and we need to benchmark. We're going to create a national registry in the UK. We want to do surgery in, in physical impairment. We want to do a registry in psychological impairment. So we need scores before and afterwards. The very best score is called the NUS questionnaire, but we need to build up our experience. Those people who are fortunate enough to pay, they still need to go in that database so we can collect their data and prove that you can massively improve people's psychological uh, life. We've heard it loud and clear today. The reason vacuum bells are not available in England is a misunderstanding. It's nothing worse than, nothing more than that. NHS England, nationally, I asked them to say, when they decommissioned surgery, please say you support conservative treatment. And they couldn't because it's not their remit, as Fiona said. We've got to fix that. We've got to tell people loud and clear that not only is it safe and effective, as you've seen in Glasgow, it, it avoids surgery. It avoids this spiral of harm. And so it's got to be as liberal as a scoliosis. If you see a patient and you've got scoliosis, if you see a GP when you've got scoliosis, they will send you to a scoliosis service at a drop of a hat instantly. And then if you turn around and say, I've got pectus 2, they'll look the other way. I mean, crazy, isn't it? And they're the same orthotists. My orthotist is a scoliosis orthotist. He's bracing the back and he braces the front and he gets the same success. Uh, and um, and so we really need to get that message out. It's going to save the NHS money, not cost it. Uh, and we strongly believe that uh, the vacuum bell works in the right young people with a depth of less than 2.5 centimetres. The evidence is even better for bracing for carinatum. Pushing the chest in is so much easier than pulling it out. This can be effective up to 15, 16, and as you've seen from Carl's data, he fits most people with carinatum, but you've got to get them early enough. I've had to operate on people of 25, 30, and, and more than that uh, because they got missed by their GPs and they didn't get braced when they were 12 or 13. Uh, and our guiders will very clearly, with a class one level of indication, say you must have that. And we need experts uh, to guide us through it. There's a lot of failed treatment for bracing when they put it on for one or two hours a day and build up. You can buy it on the internet, unfortunately. So some people buy them off the internet, put them for one or two hours a day, they get frustrated, they don't get a good effect because you need the experts behind you to say, you've got to wear it all day and all night. Short, sharp, shock. So you need the experts behind you. Pectus and Marfans, I'm so grateful to Anne Charles, uh, who's just here, taking a selfie. Um, she's absolutely a wonderful lady, and uh, she's been the, one of the most responsive people on email that I've actually come across, so, so which I'm tremendously grateful for. And uh, if anybody wants to know anything about Marfans, Lois Dietz, you know, she's an absolute international expert, and she's been really helpful in showing me, opening my eyes to the fact that we've got to got to screen everybody with pectus deformity just to make sure they haven't got a life-threatening potentially uh, illness which is Marfan's Lois Dietz or another connected tissue disorder. This is vital and not expensive and we're going to recommend that very strongly with Anne Child's help uh, and with the help of the Marfan's uh, organisation. Uh, so that's great. We're going to make some, op some operative recommendations. Uh, I personally believe that uh, Nas and Rabic is, is suitable for for severe excavatum and it's the patient choice that decides. There's little twists and turns around that, but, uh, but I don't think we should be dictating to you necessarily. We'll give you advice on which one is simpler and easier, but both I think should be available. I think both will be available in our trial as well, I really, really hope. There are a few other sort of novel procedures, uh, one called pectus up, and we do pectus implants as well, and Ian's an expert in pectus implants. So for, for people with psychological harm but not physical harm, it is actually a really, really good technique, and it's 
forgotten so much. You know, it's, it's a lost it's a lost treatment uh, in this quagmire of frustration and actually we should bring that forward as well because it's really good for people with psychological impairment. Um, I couldn't stress pectus and safety too much and, uh, and Angela Whiteman's book is, is an incredible testament and I'm so grateful to her for, for bringing it here today and coming and sharing her experience and, and we all must realise that we don't want people to have surgery. I'm a surgeon so you know, to me everything's a nail and I just whack it with a, with a hammer but actually we want to avoid surgery and if we can brace everybody at the age of 10 I'll be happy. I don't mind putting myself out of a job. Um, but, uh, but we've got to do it as safely as possible. NICE have laid out really good recommendations in 2009 about what makes safe surgery. We're going to put safe recommendations on that uh, and so we'll keep it as safe as possible. So it's not a zero risk operation, it's just a low risk operation. We, we utterly realise that. Um, we've got a large bit about consent. We want you to be fully informed. We do. I have some people coming, you know, to me say, "Oh, when I have this operation, you know, my leg pain is going to be fixed. I'm going to get a Ferrari, and uh, I'll do better at my GCSEs." Well, we've got to be very honest about you about what we can achieve, what we might achieve, and what we can't achieve, and we're going to lay that out according to international data, not the in my experience, but in our international data, and we're going to have best practice guidelines for that. Um, we've already heard about analgesia. I love cryanalgesia. I've used it for five years. I think it's amazing. We're going to try and do a study in this as well. Uh, and I think it's made a, a transformative difference in the pain we've experienced. It might be a little bit different to children, but very fixed chest adults certainly it's helped incredibly. Uh, and, and, we, and we've got amazing enhanced recovery programs now to get people through surgery much uh, easier. And this is a big line of what our dream service. Uh, this is what we dream of. Centres that, that offer everything. Adults, children, uh, bracing, psychology harm, uh, benefits, uh, genetic uh, therapy. Uh, we've got an audit process. That's what we want. A national audit process for private and public partnership. Medical photography for everybody. Because as Ellie said, none of you want to have a medical photograph. And every, as soon as you come back, you're like, did you take a picture? It's like, oh, no. So everybody, we should just get pictures, have photography, 3D, um, so that we can uh, sort of get that. Um, we're going to set best practice criteria on, on what the numbers should be. Um, we won't say anything more than that. We'll try and make sure all surgeons are doing high quality surgery in the UK. But I have no doubts at all that we can offer high quality surgery. So I don't think you should worry about that. Uh, and, um, and we need to get this mix of paediatric and adult sorted because this is a teenage disorder often and it keeps straddling uh, our two camps and actually we need a unified service. Um, so that's our guidelines in, in a big whistle-stop tour. I just wanted to show you that I'm in it for the long term. My, my, my team bought me this uh, number plate for my 50th birthday. Uh, so this is going to stay on my, uh, on my uh, car forever. Um, and our future is, is, I hope, really positive based on, on the wonderful day we've had today from Aman and Ray. So, and, and, and also, just a massive thank you to Lynn. That was just an incredible book. I think we've all been blown away by that. I would personally love to send this to every thoracic surgeon in Britain. I want it out on our websites. You know, I hope everybody in the book agrees. Uh, I, I think it's, been, it's made such a difference for us, really. Um, so at the end of today, uh, we've already made huge strides. Ammon's brought NHS England to us, which, you know, that's the first time I've got to talk to somebody first time. Wonderful work. We're going to publish these guidelines and we're going to put it out there. Um, we've already heard some brilliant ideas. Let's do a GP education webinar. Let's, let's, do, let's get a little bit of funding to send a little pamphlet to every GP practice in the UK. Let's get the Royal College of General Practitioners. General Practitioners want to have this information. That's the strange thing. They're frustrated as anybody else telling someone there's nothing I can do for you. I, I, you know, I know thousands of GPs, you know, they, they don't want to tell you there's nothing they can do. They want to tell you, don't worry, there's a brilliant service. They've got that in scoliosis, they've got that in Scotland. They want to offer that in England. So let's get out and tell them about it. We've already harnessed our media interest. We've harnessed MPs because of your wonderful work. Um, we're going to get this going, and as Ammon says, I put we're going to start this going in 12 months, but I think Ammon's going to get it going even quicker than that. So um, that's about everything I'm going to say. I just hopefully everybody has uh, taken a QR code of this, or there's been lots of bits of paper. We're trying to get all your opinions on our study, uh, so please do participate on that because we want to get the study going, uh, but we want to get transformational change uh, for pectus surgery. So thank you very much, and thank you.
Thank you for coming. John, it's truly inspiring listening to you and hearing all the hard work you're doing behind the scenes, let alone what you all see John does at work. So um, you're a true inspiration to, to us all. Do any of you have any questions that you've got for Joel? Be nicer to Joel than you were to the last lady. <laughs> <laughs> He's on our side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Joel, uh, thank you for your energy, your inspiration and your expertise because you've done a huge amount of work not only in how to do guidelines but also in this guideline. It's just great, it's just great meeting all the, the patients and the families. I just want to emphasise something that we are writing into this NHS England pathway which is going to start off with very severe disease surgery. There is an arm in that for, for non-surgical treatment. So it, 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 it's in there. So everybody will be able to say, it says non-surgical treatment. These are the guidelines for non-surgical treatment. Here is the simplified pathway for non-surgical treatment. John has to write that in the next three days, sorry. But, <laughs> but, but it, it, th there will be no ambiguity. And we just need to make it happen now. We've got over COVID, we're recovering, we need to do it. So, uh, any questions first? So I just wanted to reiterate the power of all of you being here today. Um, I had a quick chat with the lady from NHS England as she was leaving and it has really made a mark on it. I can't promise you that it's going to change everything tomorrow, but the impact that Pectus has on all of you as individuals, as family members, has definitely left a mark on me as a clinician. I'm a cardiac surgeon, so I don't deal with it personally, but I can't imagine it hasn't left an impact on everyone in this room today. And your voice as patients is really powerful and Thanks to Joel, we've been able to harness that, bring you all here together and understand what it is living with Pectus. Um, from my point of view as the Society for Cardiopathic Surgery, we will continue to fight for all of you to get access to treatment that you all deserve. I think if we can use having NHS England and the Society and Joel's powerful document as a vehicle for change. We will do all of that that we can. We will continue to lean on you and encourage you to help us on this journey. Um, and so from my personal point of view, just thank you all for coming today. Um, I'd like to leave the last words for Lynn to, to, to thank you all. She's done an amazing job about bringing you together, an amazing book, and a look from an amazing person. So I'd just like to let Lynn say the final words. I'm actually a little bit emotional. I think it's just been the most incredible day. Um, it's been so many ups and downs. At times I thought I was just bored in, so I was like, I don't watch it all again, but it's on video. But um, thank you, Percy and Mark and Lorraine, for organising and having this event. And it's so incredibly encouraging to hear that you know, you're know you leading the charge. And I know we all want everything to happen tomorrow. And uh, you know, NHS is a big machine. It will take time, but it feels like it's been such a positive step in the right direction. Um, I think it's brilliant that so many people have turned up today, and I know many will want to see the video afterwards. Um, but I also, I really would say, I'm going to say thank you to us, Joel, because um, I know so many of us in the room have found a route through with your help and support, and that has not just become very clear today, but it's you're only in the English chapter in the book, for goodness sake. I think Joe's just the right idea of his story. Um, the other thank you I would say as well is Simon. Yeah, he's he's gone now, I think. Is he gone? <laughs> um, it, he's been yeah. such a, a huge help with being organised today and um, being a real champion for the book as well. So, um, yeah. On behalf of all the patients, thank you. Thank you.
Michael Steve, thank you to Emma and our SCTS um, administrator for all the hard work in making this event happen. As I said, a big thank you to the Royal College of Surgeons of England and all the other societies that have helped us. The, the Royal College has not only given us the room here today, but they've been very, very vocal in their support of, uh, for this cause. So just a big thank you to them. But um, as I said, thank you to all of you for coming here today. Please let us continue to help you and please let us use your voice to articulate, which is a very, very important condition. So thank you all very much.